Hello, beautiful people. Guess who's here visiting the channel? Well, it's her channel, really, <laughs> when she's here. So <laughs> thanks, Samantha, yeah. for coming in. <laughs> thanks for having me. Hey, beautiful people. Yeah, we're like it's like it's like a long day for us here in Florida, Florida. So we're not doing the beautiful people thing here, but uh, but we're making do. It's been a long day. But you look good. You look very good. Thanks, you too. Oh yeah, I just came from the farm, and then I, I had a. Um, I, you wouldn't have liked the way I looked when I came from the farm, but I actually washed my face for you. So Bambi says, wow. hi, Sammy from New Zealand. Hello, Elke Medina, everybody. I'm so wow. glad, you know, let's show some love to Samantha. And we're going to talk about that behavior channel misbehavior or misanalysis. I don't even know how to call it. Uh -huh. I'll ask you about it, Sam, because I'll tell you why a lot of people... I, I have caught them a few times in certain interviews that I find they've been biased or completely off. You know, it takes, it takes a simple Google search because people actually Google, unlike me, and, you know, people actually Google, they put your name and your education comes up. Can you please tell the people what, with these beautiful people here, what is your educational background? Well, I got a bachelor's degree in criminology and psychology. Shit. And then I got a master's degree, actually a double master's in mental health counseling and vocational rehabilitation counseling. And so for me, it was cool because when I was really struggling the most with disability, I knew that, you know, my degrees and my grandmother always said, your education is really important and no one can take it away from you. And I thought with disability, I was really um, like rolling an uphill battle in terms of employability and I didn't want to face discrimination. So I thought, hmm, I want a degree in something that has social utility and that helps people, but I also want to make sure that I'm less likely to face discrimination because of disability. So I went for the double masters. There you have it. And yeah. So you, you kind of know a little bit about profiling people. And the reason why I'm asking this is because I think it was the bald guy at the behavior channel behavior panel who said um uh this woman has seems to, or they were making fun of you profiling i'll tell you what really bothers me because if they're going to do they're because they're proclaimed experts that have i think between them have like 100 years of expertise on profiling people no for the reals um people their their profiling carries a lot of weight, especially on YouTube. So, oh, there you go with the eyebrow sound. See, we're gonna profile that eyebrow. Talk about that, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, like Megan yeah. is the the one tier left. I go, and since I was two, it's like, <laughs> you know, that's from dad. We learned that, and we joked about it in the family. It was called the Markle brow. And when I was younger, if I was ever on camera, a photographer, like I did some hoity-toity silly modeling when I was a teenager, they would say, put the eyebrow down, you know, so, and that was long before disability. So it's not because of any neural deficit. It's just, it's a Markle thing. So take that. <laughs> yeah, no. but it, I was, I was, I was shocked, you know, how belittling they were. Yeah. Two of them even called you stepsister. Uh, I don't know if they have since corrected it, but, you know, let me just address that. I think um, I got to hand it to Chase, who actually said some spot on things. I mean, he understands that I see life through a social lens, not just because of my education, but I've been that way since I was two. I was always pretty philosophical and interested in social dynamics. So that being said, I thought that was kind of cool that he thought that it was fair and reasonable, but to for any of them, I thought it was unprofessional. You know, I've never seen a practitioner who would swing around name calling and, you know, call someone rednecks. I know. I saw I was shocked. And I was like, no, that, that was way out of line because what that suggests is that you're not an expert. You're not professional. You are inserting your opinion that's not based on research or good deductive reasoning skills, good empirical thinking skills, but you're swinging around an opinion that is largely influenced by really, really low level tabloids. Because the only place I ever heard that was when tabloids were joking about my brother saying he would 
you know, use the Duke of Hazard's car and crash the palace gates. So then there was like, you know, you know, trailer trash and rednecks. I got to tell you, my father worked for 40 years at ABC TV. Um, the man doesn't drink. He doesn't sit around and drink beer and chew on blades of grass and listen to country music. Any of the stereotypical redneck things. But these guys seem to engage in the fallacy of stereotyping, which I, I mean, I've never seen a professional do that. So part of me was thinking, OK, is this PR? Did somebody pay them to do it? You know, I was like naturally curious because I don't think a professional would be so reckless with the world watching. And I thought that was kind of I, I just thought it was pretty shoddy. But they redeem themselves in some ways. Uh, and I hope that since I chewed them out about it, um, I hope that they went and did some research to see that I'm not a stepsister. I'm her biological half-sister. We have the same father. That means the twinkle in the eye and the genetics. <laughs> see what I'm saying? So, you know, me, Tom, and Meg share the same dad. So that's it's not a stepsister. And I think where people made that mistake was they saw articles where it called Doria our stepmother and justly so she married dad and they had Megan. She married dad. We were already, I was like, what, 15, uh, 16 when Meg was born. Um, Tom was almost 15. We're 14 months apart. So, What's so weird about all of that is that she's our stepmother, but that doesn't make Megan our stepsister. So for people not to get that, I was like, well, you know, a lot of people just don't know. So now you know. But, you know, for them to be, these are people who have a doctorate or whatever, or at least they have a master's. I mean, they, 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 especially the British guy. I don't know what the British guy's name is. He portrays himself as this posh man and blah, 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 you mm. know? So I'm thinking, wait a minute. If this, I mean, let me tell you, and, and I'll got to tell you something. They have made so much of the age difference. I have two half siblings living in Canada, North Bay, Ontario, by the way. Dana and Cindy. One of the, Dana is 14 years older than me. He's uh, yeah, he's my brother, and 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 Cindy is 12 years older than me. And I am 14 years older than my little sister, who is um, yeah. And I call her little sister. They even went and said, uh, well, she talks about, and she calls her little sister, which is weird. No, I actually, you know, well, she's she's not little anymore. She's like 40s or something, you know. But um, mm -hmm. but um, I the age difference they make it sound like you are not you can't have nothing in common i can tell you that i was very close up mm -hmm. to, to my sister my little sister even though when 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 she was three years of age i went to canada it was so hard for me to leave you know but i paid for her wedding i put her through school i mean the, the and this is way before internet and with mm -hmm. my half sister cindy when 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 robin got married and she came to nicaragua you know from canada and um, I mean, we hadn't seen each other like a couple of years ago, but it was like right back on, you know, like having, you know, I call Cindy, you know, Henry goes to see her and, and they, don't, they don't talk every day. People have lives, but it doesn't mean that's it. And I don't call Cindy my half sister. She's my sister. Right. right. And similarly, we never addressed Megan as half sister, you know, uh, I, and I think to get back to what you're saying about with an age difference, you might not be BFFs in the sense of playing and, and being of the same peer group, but that doesn't make you any less brothers and sisters. For example, I mean, I think when she was born, I mean, one of my first thoughts was, hmm, I can give her advice about dating. I can give her advice about all of those life things, you know, the school of hard knocks that I've been through. So it's almost like you maybe feel like an aunt or an, being an older sibling is different, but you're, I think, more protective and in more of, I mean, I think it's kind of fun to know that you can help guide your siblings, that you can be there when they call, when they're depressed, and you have to tell them to open their curtains and go for a jog because it stimulates endorphins. And we had conversations like this. 
and not just because I was going to counseling school, but to me, it's, you know, it's the big sister thing and you can um, guide them and help them in ways that you might not be able to if you were their exact age or a peer. And, you know, people need to remember too that she was in school all day, you know, with peers her own age. So can you imagine older brother and sister like toting around, hanging around all the time? They'd be like, uh, can you please go away? My friends are coming. Those are my friends. No, you know, kids don't want their older brother and sister hawking over them because they want to talk about private peer things. You know, they want to they want to be kids and they want to gossip about things at school that naturally brother and sister aren't privy to and couldn't really relate to. I mean, times change, but people don't. We could relate to it and that we went through it, but that doesn't mean they'd want to share it. So um, pros and cons of being an older sibling, you know. There's no, yeah, no. Can I ask you something? Because I always think, I remember when my little sister was born, I was, I think I was more excited than my mom, especially because it was a girl. And I've always, you know, like I, I always wanted a little girl. And I remember Robin was born a little bit earlier because my mom was, it was a geriatric birth. And then uh, like in their forties, you know? And so Robin was born early and I remember she was put in this incubator and I was like crying. And I remember crying, thinking I'm going to protect you for the rest of me. And I was so protect my mom. I didn't even let my mom touch her. She was like my daughter. And it's so funny because my mom is very brown skin. So whenever we went out, people thought she was the babysitter, but my mom thought it was funny, you know, cause Robin was so white. But uh, did you, how did you feel when, when she was born, when you saw her? Um, well, I had seen her or, you know, sort of envisioned her in the womb, like Doria would put, I wrote about this in my book, put cocoa butter all over her belly and I could sort of watch the baby move like, across her stomach, you know. And as a teenager, I joked, it was like aliens, like this thing is moving under there. Is it going to pop out at any second? But it was really magical because you wonder what they look like. And yes, you do wonder about skin color. You wonder about eye color. You wonder about hair color. And it's not because you're worried about race. It's because you want to envision them at your holidays. Like you, you want to flash forward to the future. You know, it's like if you're buying something or you're shopping for a car, you want to envision yourself in the car. So when you're sitting around thinking about a car that you're going to have, you're envisioning, is it a red car? Is it a blue car? So you can see yourself driving up Pacific Coast Highway. I, I think, you know, I mean, to make it more personal, like a, a car is not a personal thing. It's an object. But you want to think about Christmases and what the child would look like sitting at the table laughing or, yes, throwing peas on the floor or, or you know, or whatever they do at, at Easter or hunting for eggs. So it's kind of magical that people would try and guess what a child might look like, which is why I thought all of the talk about skin color going around the world was ridiculous. Folks, get over it. In interracial families, it's not racist. People wonder. You know, when I had my kids, um, my first husband had more olive complexion because he was Italian. So I thought, will my daughter have olive skin and beautiful blue or green eyes? Will she be fair complected like my grandmother. It's just normal visualization. Uh, and yeah, we did. I was going to say, uh, I was going to say something else. with my son. It was the same thing. My ex-husband was Norwegian and he had like almost white eyebrows and white hair. And all my friends, we had a bet going. We made bets. I won the bet. Um, we had bets going, I mean, and they kept telling me he was going to look like Gasper, the friendly ghost, you know, and they were teasing me. He goes, Paula, when Henrik is born, you know, you're going to have a hard time finding him because <laughs> he's going to be so white because, you know, we're Canadian, European, whatever. I was, and I said, no, no, he's going to look like me. He's going to have my skin color. He's going to, mm -hmm. and we had bets. We had real bets. There was no way. Everybody was curious. My dad, you know, actually my dad turned, he would have been 90 yesterday, but um, my dad said, can you imagine Pat? What my dad calls me Pat. He used to, well, he used to call me Pat. Um, can you imagine Pat if he's like white, like that kid? And I said, what are you talking about that? You're, you're, you're a white boy too. Yeah. But he goes like Slavic, you know, Yugoslavian French. So. And then there's nothing racist. I don't know where this came from, to tell you the truth. No, I think it was just a way that people in public could feel like they were, 
you know, it's almost like in-group, out-group psychology. People want to feel like they're in the in-group. And especially with the issue of racism, I think there were a lot of people who weren't racist who were, get, were getting involved in the mudslinging and, you know, talking about um, some of the hypotheses out there and the gossip. And it had to be, it seemed like they wanted to villainize those who thought differently just because they were adjusting for the fact that they didn't understand something as simple as it's natural to wonder about skin color. They needed to make it a negative thing seemingly because it gave them an endorphin rush and made them feel like they were part of the in-group who thought that that was hateful. Rather than thinking, you know what, in interracial families, it's not hateful. And if you guys don't understand it, get counseling, read about it, have your own interracial family. And you'll see how beautiful it is. You'll see what constitutes natural wonderment. And you'll understand it a little bit better. But don't don't try and sling mud at people and involve them in your own ignorance just because you don't understand. You know, just be happy and kind of let it let it flow and assume that you don't know everything. No, but were you excited when she was brought home? Did you used to play with her? Nalia, thank you very much, Nalia. Thanks so much, sweetie. Go for it. Uh -huh. I mean, I, you know, I, th I think that's one of the funniest questions because any of you, when you have a baby in the house, oh my God, you know, they're so like bubbly and fun and exciting and giggly and amazing every day. Their little changes and even big brothers and sisters get caught up in that. You carry them around on your shoulders. You bounce them. You burp them. You change their diapers. You laugh when they ask you that. Did you change her diaper? Of course. <laughs> but, but you know what? Not, it's not. It's not a big deal. You. It's not. It's not a big deal. You know. It's, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know. I, mean, I think it would be pretty sick. I don't know any siblings that would go. Oh, I'm not changing that diaper. Of course, you change diapers. It's part of life. So, um, yeah, it was great fun. Um, what can I say though? So time goes by really fast and um, it's kind of cool being older siblings until you hear PR saying, oh, they were so old. They weren't even siblings. You know, I mean, it's it, these strangers out there with an agenda were suddenly saying we're not family. I'm like, uh, excuse me, who do you think you are? Uh, go get your nose in your own family. You know, you have no idea. And to try and quantify it, how many times do you cross paths? How many times do you interact in the course of the day when you're home, when you're doing stuff on the weekends? You can't. And as I told people before, you know, in the 1980s uh, and even the early 90s, people weren't running around with cell phones. Everything was not a Kodak moment. It's not like, oh, my God, let's do selfies here. Let's do a picture here. Let's do that. Life happens. And the only one that had a camera really was dad. So it, it's just a weird generational thing to see people say, well, you should have way more pictures. You said, no, because we're not like you guys. We're not photographing every inhale and exhale. Because we and the cell phones back then when they did come out were like these big bricks. You didn't have them unless you were like the CEO of a company. I didn't know any teenager running around with the cell phone when they first came out. And I didn't know any running around with a Polaroid land camera either. So, <laughs> no, it's actually, you know, people are asking if you know where Doria was. I don't know if you knew because I think uh, you left when they, when, when, when they started to get divorced and stuff like that. Was she maternal mm -hmm. with Megan when you, when, when she came to the home with the baby or was she? Well, I, I, I didn't leave. Um, it's pretty normative in America and I don't know how many other countries. When you're 18, your parents, it's not normal and it would be kind of weird to always be, I mean, except for the pandemic. But 18 year olds don't stay at home living under their parents' roof. You go out, you get a job, you get an apartment, you go to school, you do a lot of things. So even given that though, we were like 10 or 15 minutes away. Uh, so I don't really think that's leaving. You know, you're, you're out no, of the no, nest. No, no, you know what I mean? When you were not in the same oh, home. You're out of the nest, but you're still in the yard. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the way it is, so. Yeah.
No, because I don't know. People are asking my, but I don't think you know because I don't think you were like involved with Doria and your father's life very much in that sense. I imagine, and I guess. Well, no. I mean, when and my father is very forthcoming in saying that um, Meg lived with him from like junior high on. You know, it was full time. Um, before that, it was having two households, one bridge. So um, when she was really little, she would live. Um, part of the week with dad, part of the week with Doria, and then it became Doria on the weekends or every other weekend, and then it became full-time with dad. So just to set the record straight, and my dad is pretty clear about that. And so when we didn't see Doria, you got to remember, I was working. We're not Silver Spoon kids. I had a job. Meg was in school all day. Tom had a job. We didn't stop and pivot and go, where's Doria? So we didn't see her. And honestly, it wasn't anything malicious. It's not like I didn't care because of some character flaw. We just had life going on and so many distractions and responsibilities that I didn't think about it. Yeah. It sounds weird, but, um, and there was no, no. a period of time where we didn't see her, but we had so much to fill the calendar, school, dad worked in television. We both had jobs weekend festivities that you get busy time goes by really fast you have fun and you don't you don't stop nobody made it an issue like if dad would have said uh where's doria we would have thought about it but it, nobody ever drew attention to it so it, so it's kind of weird for me to hear all of the rumors out there but uh, what excuse did doria give for not being mega market because i'm a mom you know, and that's that's really weird because she was healthy, unlike you, because some people have said, why did you give up your kids and stuff? I think you've given explanation over. We're going to go. We're going to finish this because we're going to go to the behavior panel. And I'll tell you why, because the behavior panel people did not profile Doria. Did you notice that they have never profiled Doria, who's one of the main figures of Meghan Markle there? Not even, I don't think they did the Netflix. They didn't profile her. They profiled mm -hmm. Megan and, and Harry, but they didn't profile Doria. They stayed away from her unless I'm wrong. Well, here's the golden opportunity. There's a great idea. You yeah. know, it, it is, you know, and you got to remember, I mean, even with the Netflix, which I think had a skewed agenda uh, from behind a paywall, I'll be really open about that one. Uh, you got to remember that when you see an interview, you're talking about an interview that is structured. There is an interviewer asking pointed questions and the answers are usually edited to fit that narrative. In other words, a lot of what we said wasn't used. And I think my dad was kind of feeling like he, he wanted to say so much and did, but it didn't end up in there. And so it seemed like even though it got, the message across in a comprehensive way, it left out a lot of the beef and the heart and soul that I think my dad especially wanted to convey because he felt as though it made him look slovenly or it made him look that it, that it took advantage of the fact that he had had a stroke. And as one of the panelists said, he thought it was four years ago. The stroke was last year. Okay, and, and four years ago was two heart attacks. So to have two heart attacks, go into a pandemic and be an isolate because the whole world is masking up and staying home and businesses are closing everywhere. And then have a stroke and try to be social coming out of all of that. Like you're almost, how much closer can you get to being on your deathbed than that? And to feel like you are being made like a dog and pony show in public as you're grasping to try and stay alive and to recover from something so horrible as a stroke. So let me just clarify one of the, the fallacies I think these guys engaged in, and we all know this as educated people and practitioners, you never, ever, stereotype about disability. You can't stereotype about a stroke because everyone presents differently. And I, you know, a couple of the chat rooms 
and I respect this. I get it. You know, I, I don't fault anybody. Someone said, well, my dad had a stroke and he didn't do that. So I don't buy this Thomas Markle thing. Uh, let me remind you, everybody's body and brain are different. And when you have a stroke, it happens in different areas of the brain. So if you have a stroke, he didn't have it in the um, frontal lobe. He had it in the area of the brain responsible for speech production. So think about this. A man who has spent his whole life behind the camera, who's somewhat shy, but a really good guy and a, an effective communicator. He's a great writer, but who has been behind camera his whole life, now has a stroke, struggles to learn how to form words again, right? Think about it. Not the association and the memory recall, not the hippocampus, not remembering objects and the words associated with them. Because at his age, and thank God, he didn't have damage in that part of the brain. Because then people would present with like a total sense of disconnectedness and inability to remember things and to be able to form words associated with them. But thank God that he had that intact. And his struggle was the area of his brain that makes the tongue move, that forms the words. So that, and you know, for a man who is in his 70s and who always prided himself on his successes at 79, you know, multi um, two time Emmy award winner as a director of photography and lighting director, very proud of his work and he works so hard to give us all a great life, to do that 70 hours a week on his feet, uh, which is why he has leg pain and back pain. That's got nothing to do with the stroke. So these guys said something about his body and his posturing. You know what? The man was on his legs 70 hours a week, and he's a tall man, mostly legs. His legs hurt. 70-hour uh, weeks, sometimes two hours of sleep in a 24-hour period because of the television schedule. So he hurts. And that being said, everyone with the stroke presents differently, depending on what area of the brain they had the stroke in. So please don't ever assume. Uh, and my dad's always counted on his fingers. So when he looks at his hand and holds up four fingers, he's always done that. He gestured with his hands. That's what people in television do. So maybe that's a learned behavior too, like the eyebrow. Uh, you know, you pick up things in your environment. It doesn't, it, you can't stereotype and generalize what you think you know from a textbook or from your life experience about strokes or facial expressions or anything, unless you really know the backgrounds of the individuals, their exact condition, their etiology. Like, for example, with MS, I really hate hearing people make assumptions about MS, like, oh, Someone said on Twitter years ago, oh, Samantha must have cognitive deficit because of MS. You know, it makes people loopy and it makes people forget their way home. Well, there are a number of conditions that involve those symptoms. MS is not typically one of them, although people with MS can have brain MRI lesions. Mine have always been in my T and C spine, which affects my arms, my legs. And I've gotten a little bit worse, but no cognitive dysfunction. So the stereotypes, I think, are, you know, people, you guys don't like stereotypes about skin color. That's like saying everybody with a certain skin color has to be a burglar or uneducated or, you know, stereotypes, no matter how you're applying them, are really ignorant. It just doesn't fly in the face of an evolved society. So without seeming like I'm lecturing, please don't fall into that trap. You have to you know, look at people on a case by case basis. And um, not all people with MS, there are people with MS who have a lot of brain MRI lesions and who have cognitive difficulties. God bless them. Um, and they can walk and play tennis and run a five minute mile. And then there are people like me who don't have the brain MRI lesions, but who have a high level of physical disability. So people are asking, people, are, I, I, I completely agree with you, Sam. People are asking why your father is so obsessed with Megan, why he wants her back so much. What do you think um, that is? I mean, I don't, I'll tell you what, my take on it is that I think he, this is the, the, the kid that he raised from, because you guys were with your mother, right? So that, I think, no, 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 no. There's another stereotype. 
for a year, I went out there. Um, until I was 11 or 12, it was mom and dad. My mom and dad divorced. And when I was really little, we spent split time with mom and dad. Um, but dad was never out of the picture. And then from the age of 12 on, I went and lived with dad. So um, my dad is very dear to me. My dad is my best friend. My dad is my heart and soul. And um, although I can you know, be professional and try and be objective, when I see the world trashing my dad, who's been through so much, who is very fragile, of course I rise to his defense because he can't, and it's wrong. I mean, I just, like, I, I watched a lot of that, and I thought, wow, are we back to the 1600s? So he is that, and I'm this, because they said so. And they're out there, you know, getting the, setting up the stake and getting ready to burn us on it. And my poor dad is reading all this stuff this dysfunctional PR and seeing people in lightning speed social media react to it. Like in the old days, if you read a tabloid, you'd have to see it on the stands at the grocery store. Now, boy, an article comes out and bloggers and other aggregate news, other outlets are copying it. Before you know it, it's around the world and it is the gospel. And you have no defense. You can't say, ah, uh, who ordered this hit? Who paid for this? Where is this coming from? Because that's not true. And, and you can be out there and you can say that's not true, but you shouldn't have to spend your life throwing out receipts because some numbskull put something out in the media that's not true and everybody copied it. Just because people copy it, and sometimes you'll even see things in quotes. You'll be like, I don't give a rat's ass if you see it in quotes. If you didn't see my mouth move, you can't say I said it. So it, it's a really weird phenomenon, this digital media and cyberspace, in that, you know, like, I mean, I used to study the effect of the television, the box in the living room on behavior, on values, on aggression. And I would look at those studies about how the television in the living room after the 50s affected people their lifestyles, their, their value system. But my God, you look at now this digital media leagues beyond the effect of the television. And all it takes is, you know, a hundred people writing the same bold font article. And before you know it, people are like, cause everybody's too busy to do their homework and engage in deductive reasoning and compare and contrast. So they see that headline and they're like, wow, she did that? Wow, oh my God. Uh, instead of saying, yeah, I'm busy in my day, but before I burn this person at the stake, shouldn't I do some homework and make sure that's true? Uh, and so it, it was a weird phenomenon and to see these behavior panel guys regurgitate some of the stereotypes that were out there in tabloids I was like, wow, we know we've got a big problem when social labeling and stereotyping because of propaganda and the media influences guys who claim to be experts. Whoa, times have changed. Uh, and, and it's more dangerous because the power of the printed word, oh my God, that professionals have to remind themselves nowadays and step back and say, uh, I'm a professional, I'm educated, so I'm going to look at population samples when I look at polls. Instead of saying that eggs give you cancer, I'm not going to believe everything I read in articles, even if they say it's a Gallup poll. Uh, I'm going to look for evidence, and if you're hearing disparaging things about people, I hope to God that you're willing to take a step back and say, that's a fallacy, that's PR, that's propaganda, uh, it's paid for in most cases, and I'm going to zip my lip before I comment, because how would you like it if you were in an elevator and there's someone standing next to you, leaning into the woman next to her and going, did you know that he raped somebody? He did. I read it. Oh, my God. Could happen to you. So, and we're, we are not that far away from the 1600s. I don't care if it's 2023. I watch people nowadays and I'm like, oh my God, I thought our brains had developed. We were educated. We evolved. 
Yeah, so I, basically, you don't think your father is obsessed with her. You think that he's in shock from everything that's happened, mm -hmm. and they're calling it obsession because he simply can't understand what's happened, and he's had two strokes, two heart attacks, and a stroke, and he just can't come to grips with the fact of what they is. Like, I got to get it. I wonder, and we didn't ask. I would love somebody to sit down and do a panel on these guys. Do yeah. you guys have kids? What if your whole life, and it's not obsession, it's called L-O-V-E, love. And if you can understand what that feels like when you give a child everything, your hopes, your dreams, you wake up, all you care about is their smile and that they get through school safely and that they learn something so that someday... You can look at that and go, wow, I'm so proud of him or her. That's my babe. It's love. And, and parents get this. So to call it obsession in a demeaning way is goddamn stupid. And it suggests to me, like if I were doing a panel, I'd say, wow, I see some attachment issues in whoever said that. Wow. Was there an abandonment issue? Wow. Are there some things latent here? Is this person an angry mama's boy? Like we can all sit around and throw out stereotypes, but unless you know the people you're talking about, it's idiotic to do that. And which is why, you know, I like my gut reaction was to shred these guys and I called them unprofessional at first, although they redeemed themselves and I thank them for a couple of things I saw them say later. Um, I did say it's really unprofessional. It's really unethical. And anybody, anybody who claims to be an expert should know better yeah because you know what you're not hurting me when you throw out that 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 fallacious crap you're hurting yourself because you're calling yourself an expert over here on this side of your mouth but you're acting like an ignoramus on the left side of your mouth look at this cc she said samantha do you think you have similar characteristics as megan do you have um, some similarities and uh, clearly you have differences but you have similarities too Wow, don't laugh. I mean, that kind of gets me choked up because I was joking with someone the other day. I even said to my dad, I said, oh, my God, except for the bad traits and that I don't treat people like this. Um, I would give the shirt off my back for anybody who needed it. Um, I said she doesn't even realize that we are more alike than we are different. Like wow. I'll, hear about, I'll hear about the food she likes or the things she's done, the places she's been in her life. We've lived, we've, I think, walked up similar paths, um, similar social circles, albeit different, but the same types of people. And we like a lot of the same things. Like one of the um, coolest places we used to go to eat was called Zanku Chicken. I love hummus. So every time I, I heard her say that, I was like, is she stealing that from me? Or do we both just like it? And she's got a freckle on her lip on the same place that I do. And we both do the eyebrow thing. So there are a lot of little similarities. And I think it's just kind of weird that people out in public are going, ah, they're not even sisters. And, you know, Samantha's got blonde hair. It's dyed, folks. I have dark hair. Uh, <laughs> but my dad always said, God, you two look so much alike uh, and would show us pictures. And I would look at us during different stages of our lives. And I'd go, wow, and sometimes she looks like me and dad. Sometimes she looks like Doria. But that's how kids blossom and unfold sometimes they look more like mom or dad and that again is one of the cool things about being a parent or being a sibling even if you're older is watching these things present and watching them change it's like i don't, I don't know how to describe it. it it's um something bigger than all of us and it kind of reminds me how small we are in the universe and that there really is god and that no matter what, why well, I, I don't want to get philosophical about it, but it really is amazing. So, uh, yeah, just I, I'm just gonna dispel a couple of things here. Yeah. Meghan Markle is 41 years of age, mm -hmm. right? People are going. I don't know why I keep asking because you've answered this question before. She's 41 years old. Mm -hmm. Sam can't know whether they're surrogates or not because she doesn't speak to Megan. Megan didn't even invite her to the wedding. <laughs> Megan has said that she's an only child. So how can Sam know whether she used surrogates or not? The people who okay. would know that would be the royal family. 
Right, exactly. And so who's saying I said I know? That's another thing. Like, I'm hearing all of these rumors out there. In 2000, almost 19, about Archie, um, my father had been very forthcoming and talking about frozen eggs. And I said, well, that would make sense. And, you know, it, it's my thought then was it's really cool if you can afford it. I mean, I fully expected like a spread on Vogue magazine. Remember when Demi Moore showed her bare stomach, how cool and beautiful that was? I thought maybe since we're in a new era, maybe there will be a Vogue magazine article about surrogacy. So for me, it wasn't a negative thing. It was an honest uh, inference because my father mentioned she picked up her frozen eggs. I knew that they could afford it. And then Harry slipped and said, oh, he's changed so much in the last two weeks. And the public was like, two weeks, what do you mean? Are we, he was supposed to be born yesterday, so you're telling us. So it was a slip. And I think from that, a lot of people were like, that would make sense. Maybe a weaning period from a surrogate, two weeks. You don't just abruptly take a baby away from its birth mother because of biorhythms, scent, hormones, and everything. It could be traumatic. So it all made sense to me. and But no, I don't know. And I've never said I know that she used a surrogate. I always just thought it kind of makes sense. And it's so cool. And, you know, that doesn't stigmatize children. People are like, oh, that's nasty to say about children. Why is that nasty? Because you say it's nasty. I think it's a beautiful thing. So it was really the public turning it into something negative. When we're thinking, wow, kids are loved whether they're adopted, surrogated, they're still a gift from God and magical. So it was these nasty trolls in the public stigmatizing the children. Because me saying, well, they might have been born of a surrogate, that's not stigma. The stigma is the public going, oh, she's, that's nasty. Well, that's your assumption. And if you don't like surrogacy, then that's your problem. Uh, but I kind of feel like it's a beautiful thing. But, but no, you, don't know whether, you don't know whether she, she used a surrogate or not. No, and I think we all kind of saw a lot of moon bump pictures around the world with a pillow that dropped that were taken by the very credible Getty images. So there were a lot of things taken together that made that make sense. And we also heard that she wouldn't let a royal physician examine her womb. Now, I don't know about you girls, but... Most women I know would be like, if they're having a royal baby, you would want that doctor all up in your business. Are you kidding? Yeah. To make sure not only, I mean, because it's an honor, you're in the best of hands, royal physicians for the safety of your baby. You'd be like, oh my God, yes. Examine me, make sure everything's perfect because you have the opportunity to have such top-notch care. So I think a lot of people thought that was odd too. So all things taken together it made sense that there might be a surrogate and yeah. I didn't see a problem with that, but some trolls yeah. did. Yeah, no, the problem is Sam, that if she did use a surrogate and she lied about it, if she did use a surrogate, the children can't be in the line of succession as per the law. So therefore that would mean that she would have had to lie about it, which is committing fraud. Because if she, for example, no. had been open and said, you know what, instead of carrying those fake baby moon bumps, you know, has she said, you know what, for X, Y, Z reason, I can't mm -hmm. carry the children, but my eggs and this are going to be used um, to bring the baby. Then mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that they would have done, uh, they would have amended the legislation in the UK. But the, but the thing is, all the lies, through the lies of and the pretense of carrying a baby bump, you know, and everything. And well, here's the skinny on that. I think, you know, for all intents and purposes, a lot of people were excited about Archie coming into the world. And I don't think most people cared what the specifics were. When people, people started to care and mention it and gossip, if you will call it that, it's not really gossip because when you're on the world stage and you're in the royal family and there are announcements every day of, about a birth, you've made it the public business. You put it in the public forum and the world is now emotionally intertwined and in Great Britain, they have an emotional, traditional investment and relationship. It's part of the culture. Of course, they wanted to know specifics and see Archie. And when they felt that they had been lied to, and I, was, I will say felt that, it feels like a betrayal of the public. 
And you know what? So what if the child doesn't get line of succession or title? Uh, billions. Well, it's clearly people. important for Meghan Markle because she's going around now. She's like fighting yeah. for the prince and princess title, you know? Well, billions of people live without titles and they do very well. So I think for the legal and monetary benefits of that, um, if there was something that um, occurred that wasn't above board, then that's for them and the royals to discuss, work out, reveal, if that's the case. Uh, and, and I think what's sad about it is that it unjustly, again, stigmatizes the kids because, yeah, they don't know what's going on now, but when they're, I don't know, seven, eight, and they start getting on the internet and Googling their names, they're going to find out. And don't you think they would look at their parents and go, uh, what's up with that? Like, why the mystery? Why the mystery about my delivery? Why no pictures of me? Like, why? Well, uh, it's illegal oh, also. It is illegal in the UK because uh, the, the, the child can only, the, there's the law that, that because if the child is going to be in the line of succession, all the records have to be public and transparent. And the child has to be lawfully begotten. Mm -hmm. And that means that the child has to come out of the woman's body. So if, if, if that's a law, that is the law, that in order for the child to be in the line of succession, it has to be lawfully begotten according to the UK laws, which means that the child must be born from the woman's body. So this is why it, 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 this is considered fraud if they lied and everything was so messy, you know, well, because okay, it's illegal. Yeah, I get that. And I respect people stating British law. They have a right to. And they have a right to know as British citizens because taxpayers fund all of this. So that being said, um, I think to uh, quash any rumors out there and gossip and end the mystery, it seems very easy to produce DNA samples. Hair is not an invasive DNA sample and or delivery certificates from a qualified physician. So in absence of those things, you think, People with nothing to hide, hide nothing. Exactly. So it's really simple. It's not a negative thing. It's not bashing. It's not stigmatizing. In other words, what gives them the right to assume that and to say that the public don't have a right? Taxpayers paid for your kids and your wedding. And British tradition uh, is heavily intertwined with the birth status of children. So you don't get to decide that's all of a sudden not important and not public business. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think in all fairness uh, for the world, it's easy. Yeah. Put out the birth certificate, put out the DNA proof. Yeah. What can you know, I, I was going to ask you, um, there's, um, you know how Chase and I, I think it was, Greg, no, Mark, one of those guys, he said that you he called you guys rednecks. But then I wonder where that came from, because you guys are from California. And if you guys are rednecks, so is Meghan Markle. Exactly. Uh, you know, again, going back to tabloids, I think uh, uh, here, that was the most unprofessional part of it, aside from just stereotyping about strokes and disability, which I don't, I don't think educated professionals would ever do knowing that there's such a vast array of um, differences, case to case, symptom by symptom. Uh, and I've never heard of anybody doing that. That was shocking. But when you throw disparaging uh, negative terminology out there and you, call, you, you engage in name calling on the right side of your mouth while you're claiming to be a professional, rednecks, excuse me, I, we haven't chewed on blades of grass or sat around a campfire and sang country songs with hay rides and uh, redneck is a, a very derogatory stereotype my dad worked at abc for 40 years highly technical highly professional and we were raised you know we weren't rich but i would say we were upper middle class kind of snooty in our taste eclectic jazz classical music my dad used to work on a show called soundstage so we were exposed to every kind of music when we were young kids and met a lot of the musicians. So what was really cool about that is, no, nah, we weren't rednecks. Uh, we were, I think, um, culturally 
educated, diverse, intellectual, and you know, that, what a stupid thing to say. No, and so I was sitting there going, oh, they're the rednecks. Look at that guy. He must be an overgrown mama's boy. And so I was just spewing all these stereotypes too. <clears throat> and I thought, excuse me, my throat's dry. I thought, um, I'm not going to engage in the same kind of trench mudslinging and calling that they are because I just said that they're unprofessional and unethical. So why would I do the same thing? You know what I mean? And how would they like it if, if someone got together and did a panel on them out of like total ignorance, just going on stereotypes. Oh, look at his slovenly hair. He looks like a mama's boy that never got out of the basement when it was time when the dinner bell rang. Oh, look at him. He looks like he never had a little wow, chicka wow wow. He's probably uh, got an Oedipus complex and has sexual issues. Like how rude and awful. And, you know, it, it was what it was. But. I was going to ask you, do you think your father, because from my point of view, Meghan Markle has already buried him. He no longer exists. Even Harry said that. He saw he saw her mourn the loss of her father. So, do you think that your father doesn't understand that Megan, she's basically buried him and has a your profile that's basically saying I know this man no longer exists. At least the man that I grew up as a father is no longer around. Do you think that that is something that your father can come to terms with? That Meghan Markle has complete. I mean, she didn't say. Oh, you know, my I, I don't speak to my father or my father and I are not speaking. She said, I lost my father. All right. Well, let me just state clearly that this is my opinion, that that is a coping strategy. It's a form of denial uh, to cover up seemingly guilt over one's own egregious actions in this case and disregard. So I think it's a way of, you know, depersonalizing someone so that you don't really have to face the feelings or the connection. I'm not, I, I'm not going to compare her to sociopaths and serial killers, but depersonalization is a pretty common coping strategy when individuals want to objectify people in their lives and not have to feel very much. And that's kind of sad and disappointing. I think again, uh, my dad's not obsessed, but that's shocking. What a shocking feeling to deal with that your child <clears throat> who you love more than life is objectifying you and writing you off as the shoes you throw in the closet. Oh, well, I that's know. what I was thinking because to me, it looks like he's in denial about Meghan Markle's feelings or lack of feelings, you know, because I mean, Shit. I mean, I can fight. I, I, I can fight with my parents and stuff, and my siblings and stuff. But I would never say, "Oh, I lost them." I know. I mean, it, well, it's especially know, in global platforms. No, no, he's not in denial. In my opinion, she is in denial. She doesn't want to face that she iced him and depersonalized and objectified him conveniently to suit an agenda. In my opinion. So in order to treat people so poorly, people who are, I will say, um, less capable of empathy, remorse, and shame, and not in touch with people in a connected way, will objectify them. In other words, they're no different than a prop in the living room or a pair of shoes in order to deal with the man they see in the mirror, in this case, the woman in the mirror in my opinion. And it makes it, it's, it's a way of rationalizing to justify what you've done that's so horrible in the eyes of so many. But in your mind, when you look in there, oh, I had, I had a reason to do that. Um, yeah, it was terrible. I lost my dad. You didn't lose your dad. You iced your dad. There's a very, very big difference. But there must be, there must be something about Mr. Markle that he must say, I can't believe she said that. That must be something that, you know, I, I, yeah. I can't imagine my son saying that about me. Knock on wood, you know. Yeah, it would be, it, it's hurtful. And I, I mean, I think though, even, the, you know, the behavior panel guys kind of picked up on that. You know, they know. Uh, so, I mean, they, they're right about some things, but 
I don't think they fully understand. And they seem to have been influenced by tabloids that were out there saying, you know, she was raised with Doria. No, she was not raised with Doria. She was raised with dad as her primary parent. So to say, you know, to call dad a redneck or have the impression or, 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 or think that he was less invested uh, and that he's just someone out there obsessing. Why won't he let her go? Uh, that's, he's her primary parent, loved her beyond, like, it's like, can you imagine someone just walks up to you, rips your heart out of your chest, how that void feels. Like, it is that powerful. It is, you know, they say that the heart is the organ of love. And people do die of broken hearts. There's a reason for it. We don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how to explain that medically. Yeah, no, no, I understand. I understand. I understand completely. But you're, I can imagine the shock your father is on. It's in because this is so public. I mean, I mean, this is not even a lot. This is very public, and and it's been said in big platforms. I mean, it, it is quite shocking. And you know, I was looking at the uh, the panel that they did the the Netflix thing and. I don't remember them criticizing Megan very, Megan very much for her reaching out to your daughter and having her there, you know, and it's like, those are things that as a behavior analyst, I would have said, wait a minute, you don't know the woman, but you're having the daughter, you're going out of your way to establish a friendship mm -hmm. with the daughter of your non-existent sister. I mean, I'm, I was very shocked. They don't, this is why I'm saying they're very biased and it's like they're pushing this particular and a particular agenda which i still don't know which one it is but that to me wow. as a behavior analyst i would have been wait a minute holy shit what the hell is this can you imagine Sorry, it's just my chair okay go ahead no like i would have been like this is fascinating this woman is basically belittling you in a worldwide stage uh i mean well, you know you, but yet she goes out of the way to befriend the daughter and then he oh, well, <laughs> and it, it, to the wedding. <laughs> there's so much more to it than that. I mean, we found out that, um, I found out from Royal insiders, Neil Sean talked about it. And so did some real Royal insiders let me know that the Royal family doesn't make decisions about who goes to the wedding. So when she reportedly told my daughter that she couldn't go to the wedding because of me, that was a lie that it was up to her. I found out. So she didn't tell my daughter that the reason she didn't go to the wedding was because of her control issues. She didn't want her at the wedding. See what I'm saying? So it's kind of macabre. There's a lot more there. That's also being dealt with legally. Uh, that's weaponization of my daughter. Did your father uh, have a relationship with your kids, Sam? I beg your pardon? Did your father have a relationship with your kids? I mean, did, did you see? Yes. Oh, wow. Is so, that I mean, where Megan Marple got the email oh, from? Exactly, because Megan wasn't talking to my daughter. I gave dad my email address to give to Megan because they're four years apart. I thought they should be friends. So, oh, so you're the one who gave the email, so Megan would get in touch with, some, with uh, Ashley. My, my father hadn't been talking to my daughter. He would only get her email address from me. So, in other words, these are things people didn't know about, and people were like, "Ah, oh, that's interesting." Yeah. yeah. So you gave so Meghan Markle reached out to your father and said, "Dad, can I get in touch with Ashley?" No, oh. I said to my dad, "It would be great if they would be friends." Here's her. Holy email. shit! Are you serious? So it's you who instigated the friendship between Ashley and Meghan Markle, and oh, Ashley went to Meghan's first wedding or second wedding, Trevor. That's right. And when they were little, I mean, they were four years apart. And it, what's really weird, someone was circulating a picture on the Internet of what looked like Megan with a baby. And because there was an A on the dresser, they said, oh, this has to be A for Ashley. And I was thinking, wow, people do some math. They're only four years apart. Here's a baby that um. Megan is holding. Megan's not. Wait a minute. Funny. Let me dispel this thing because a lot of people are saying, "Where is?" It? People are asking if Ashley is the daughter. So if I, if Meghan Markle is only four years older than Ashley, clearly, it's not her daughter. <laughs> Ashley was born. Yeah, I mean, they're. It's just so ridiculous. They're not. 
Um, if you look at the picture with Ashley holding the baby, Ashley is significantly older than a baby. She looks like a teenager holding the baby. So I was like, people think maybe it was a friend's baby she was holding. It wasn't my daughter. Yeah. But it's you actually who created. And then when she, uh, I think she went to Trevor's first wedding or second wedding with uh, uh, to Meghan Markle's Trevor, and you were invited to that wedding, right? Well, it was an unspoken thing because I was in a wheelchair. I was also in school. I thought, you know what? I don't want to bump my sister out. The wedding is in Jamaica on the beach. So I'm not going to be the sore thumb and have everybody feel sorry for me or, oh, my God, we've got to move the wedding because babe's in a wheelchair and wheelchairs can't go in the sand. So I just wish them well. I just said, Dad, I just want the wedding to be amazing. I don't I'm not going to make it about me and I'm not going to be a crybaby. So we really, it was just a happy thing. And it was kind of an unspoken thing that they can't go. And it wasn't just the wheelchair. I was also in school uh, and a mom. So I, all things taken together, I didn't want everyone to feel like they had to stop their life and change everything for me. Yeah, but it's incredible. it's incredible how your daughter has been weaponized. Again, that must hurt. Because now, especially now that I know you're the one who, who who wanted them to be close, but I don't think you had this in mind when, when that happened. <laughs> and I'm surprised that the behavior panel didn't actually go deeper because this is something that's psychologically well, fascinating. Yeah, and it was so weird because I sat there and I watched her and she said, well, my mom had some not so nice things to say to me. Yeah, because you didn't know at that time that PR were being paid and that she was ignoring dad. This was early on, like around and before the wedding. It wasn't that I said not so nice things. It's that I told the truth. And I said, you know what? I said, she's ignoring the family. It's not what you think it is. And if Ashley considers that not so nice, get counseling. You know, you're an immigration lawyer. Think about what you said. But I don't believe that she believed that. I felt like because we had reconnected, we were talking. And here's why I don't believe it. Um, my father recanted at the wedding how proud he was of Megan for telling Ashley that I loved her so much and I wanted them to have a charmed life. And that's why I did what I did, that I allowed them to be adopted because I didn't want them torn between two worlds, like at school friends going, how come you have a grandma and grandpa, not a mom and a dad? So I wanted them to call their grandparents ma and pa for some semblance of normalcy even if it, it meant not being with me. And it was really painful, but I don't regret that decision. And so I thought she would understand that. But to solidify it, Megan had that conversation with her at the wedding. My dad witnessed it. What do you so, mean? What, what do you mean? What do you mean Megan had that conversation with, uh, with Ashley? Megan was telling Ashley, your mother loved you so much. And you had a charmed life. Your mother did this so you could have the best of everything in the world. So to for anybody to question that or why I wanted my kids where they were when their dad and I divorced is crazy. I had an opportunity for my kids to have a charmed life. If you don't like it, not my problem. Uh, but Megan knew. So any rumors of, oh, Samantha was a high school dropout lost custody of her kids. I never lost custody of any children. There are records to prove that. And Megan knows because she had that conversation with Ashley at the wedding. My dad witnessed it. So Megan knew how much I loved my daughter. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's actually quite terrible. But do you talk to Ashley at all? I think it's really sick to weaponize my daughter against me after even, you know, in the Netflix thing, she said my mother and I had reconnected which was really cool. I allowed them, I wanted them to be raised with their grandparents, but I wanted her to know that I was here as a friend and that I cared about her and how much I wanted her to have the world. And she had told me that she was happy because she did have a great life. So for anyone in the media or social media to soil that or turn it into something negative is crazy. Uh, and no, I haven't spoken with Ashley. I think one of the things that might have happened was that Ashley and my son in the beginning at the behest of all this paid PR that was saying all sorts of horrible things that weren't true about me and my dad, I think they believed it. And I think they were so high on the royal thing uh, that they sided with Meg because they didn't know what was going on behind closed doors. 
So how foul of my sister to do that to me and to my daughter. I yeah. believe we will get that time back, be able to talk about it. But there's so much that was going on that my daughter didn't know about. Uh, and it's pretty demented. I hope you can get to talk to her because I think I think she's still talking to Megan. I think she's deep in Megan's. Uh... And and you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. But Megan needs to come clean and apologize and confess to Ashley because Megan didn't just hurt me. She hurt my daughter. Lying to anyone is wrong. Weaponizing anyone and triangulating in a relationship for a destructive purpose is wrong. It's not mentally healthy. So whatever her agenda or motives were, in my opinion, it was really demented to do that. And she's got to come to terms with it. And Who's Noelle? People keep asking me about Noelle. Who the hell is Noelle? She's my youngest daughter. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, Sam. Yeah. Well, how about, but what about Noel? And, and who's Noel now? Uh, what about her? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you're having issues. I think, is this the daughter that wanted to have a relationship with the older man and you stopped her because she was a young, a teen? Exactly. And so, okay, so there's your answer. There's right. your answer. A rebellious teen whose mother's looking out for her because she's dating an older man while she's a, an underage one, and she goes and snaps at the mother, and now I know where they're coming from. Well, there was a lot more to it than that. Um, I, I discovered their phone logs, and they were talking like every second. It was incessant. So while I thought they were just friends, I thought this guy had an agenda that was unhealthy. And when I got in the way of that and threatened to have him arrested, all hell broke loose. Um, she alleged that I was abusive. That's not yeah. true. And you know what? Bring it on. Let's talk about it. Because you're in a wheelchair. I mean, how much abuse can you hurl at? I mean, oh, you're yeah. going to wheel and, your way around. <laughs> I'm so, so, I mean, to, so, to make fun of it, but it's true. You know, I mean, how can you be, ab if anything, you are more at a risk of being abused because well, of your disability. Exactly. I mean, she could have flicked me and I would have fallen out of my chair, but that's not at issue. I think, you know, it, <laughs> And I'm, I was just as hurt as my dad was over Meg. You know, you can give your kids all of the tools you think they should have in their toolbox. You can love them. You can give them, like I always told her, I'll give you 99% of what you want and 100% of what you need. That doesn't mean they're going to make the right choices. That doesn't mean they're going to reciprocate the love in the ways that you expect. So you almost have to let go of some of your expectations. And like my dad, you can be hurt. It's not obsession. It's shock. And so when my daughter did that, you know, uh, Special Commissioner Benford in Domestic Violence Court, this is what trolls don't get. They're circulating and photoshopping documents and saying, oh, she was abused. No, I was never criminally charged. Nothing ever moved forward. And in Domestic Violence Court, my ex-husband tried to get an order of protection against me. And it was dismissed with prejudice. But because the document was reverse captioned flowing from the original divorce, People were going, aha, Samantha tried to get an order of protection and it was dismissed with prejudice. So Samantha's the villain. No, it was reverse captioned. And that's noted on the CD-ROM and in the court transcript from Domestic Violence Court. So it was kicked out. It had no merit. There was never any emotional or physical abuse noted in the dismissal with prejudice. And furthermore, Commissioner Benford said to this stupid CYFD field agent, who was overly zealous, untrained. It was her first case. She just wanted to like get somebody. And this is the problem. The DOJ were overhauling New Mexico CYFD at that time. So Commissioner Benford said, uh, Ms. Davis, where are you getting this from? And she goes, uh, 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 this is audible on CD wrong. That's the craziest crap. Uh, it must have happened in the past. What happened in the past? Oh, uh, uh, well, are you aware, Ms. Davis, that Samantha can't get out of her wheelchair? That she has help with all ADLs? That somebody has to help her wash her hair? Like if I stood, how, uh, uh, how could I throw a teenager into a wall? It, do, I, do I levitate in my sleep and I don't Maybe know? Maybe a shoe and even then you don't even have the strength to throw that <laughs> well, well, I mean, I think it, it was heartbreaking, but it was almost like a tragic comedy because I thought, are all these people this brain dead? that you can't use deductive reasoning skills and figure out that a daughter five foot six 
could knock me out of my chair and on my keister. If I tried to stand, I fall to the ground like a limp dish rag. I don't stand. So, you know, and if someone in a wheelchair, people have said, oh, well, people are caregivers are abused by their, you know, their patients in wheelchairs all the time. Yeah, if you're grabbing them, lifting them, or if you're being abusive to them. But if someone's in a wheelchair and you don't like what they say or do, do you think you could jump on a couch or run out the door? And there's not a thing the person in the wheelchair can do. Logic. I well, was going to tell you, they just, in, in the behavior panel, the guys, they fixated a lot in this. They go, well, Thomas Markle said, how can I fix this? The bald guy, he was like, um, clearly he's obsessed about fixing something because he feels, I think he said something that he knew that he had messed up. And I'm like thinking, wait a minute, you know, he can't fix what he didn't break. I actually said it in my video. Right. You know, but I can imagine that he's trying. To, and I said to him, he, and I even in my video, I said, you know, you should stop apologizing and trying to fix something because this, the, I, I don't even think this can be fixed anymore. I mean, you know, when even when you break a vase and, and you put it back together, there's scars. It's never the same. You here's, know, here's the problem. There are some parents, I even did this for a while with my daughter who clearly lied, who clearly was the problem, and who clearly hurt her mother in the wheelchair, okay? But as a parent, you love your kids, so you want to be bigger than that. You want to take the high road. And I think my dad is so soft, like, he'll blame himself for things he didn't do just to be able to have communication. That's called enabling, though. With certain personality types, especially if someone is a narcissist, you don't ever ever want to do that because you will be a victim on continuum because they become emboldened by your weaknesses. They see your soft spots. They see what buttons to push and they will continually do it until they have exhausted you into oblivion, broken your heart. Uh, I mean, through two heart attacks, a pandemic and a stroke to still be pulling the same kind of crap, strings, avoidance. You know, it's like when she was younger, she did this little video and she was in Hollywood Hills with her friends being cool. And people were saying, oh, look, they already, they didn't get along even when she was a teenager. Look at this video. Yeah, but you didn't look at his side of the story. So her little video was skewed. She said, oh yeah, my dad lives up there, but we're not exactly getting along right now. And what she failed purposely omitted to tell people was that she had iced him for two weeks. The word ice, not I lost, I iced dad for two weeks because there was a production. My dad built the stages and the sets that she danced on. I think it was for Jam Yankees Gigi Perot. And Meg said um, she wasn't getting along with Gigi. So she told dad, here's an ultimatum. Um, no, quit the production. Don't, don't do this. I don't, I, I'm, you know, because she was mad at Gigi. She wanted my dad to walk off. Well, professionals don't do that. And because he refused to quit the production, she iced him out for two weeks. So, you know, it's, and he's got an enabling personality. He's so soft hearted that in my opinion, over time, because he would always come back and say, I'm sorry, let's make up. Well, you don't have to be sorry. She needs to apologize. Hey, let's get Nancy Grayson on this. You know, you can't enable people who are going to abuse you and who thrive on. Yeah. So uh, do you think that, that is enabling a little bit of, uh, is enabling Megan with all of his apologies? I'm, have you had this conversation with him and try to make him understand that what he's doing is actually making it worse? Because basically I see that for me, I don't know about you, but I, I think that Megan is a narcissist. In a psychopath, I, I don't really think she's capable of feeling like I think the way she discards people, and mm -hmm. I really think that Doria's in the chopping block next, you know. Um, but I, I, it's 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 something that you know it's when she was talking in the in the mm -hmm. Oprah, there was no sorrow when she said she lost uh, your dad. It's like, well, I lost him. It's like very dismissive, you know. It's like there's really no no sense of loss there. Yeah, that felt like the Africa poverty video at the end, in my opinion, when she said, you know, with this 
what seemed like a fake tear in her eye. They're talking about starving children in Africa. And she said, well, I'm glad somebody asked about me. Well, it's not about you, darling. It's about starving children in Africa. And so there was this little, what seemed like a fake tear in her eye. And I, you know, it just seems like a manipulation strategy and tactic. Uh, but I think with dad, you know, I think over years, in my opinion, a lot of these uh, armchair diagnoses going around the world, some even from reputable psychologists like Dr. Carol Malone, who said verbatim, she's a malignant narcissist. Who said that about you or Megan? About Megan, Dr. Carol Malone. And it's on YouTube. And so there are people who are practitioners who have said that. And I agree with those distant diagnoses uh, because she, her, her actions meet the DSM criteria for that. So the, the bottom line is it's not hearsay. It's not everybody just saying she is. When she's demonstrating those behaviors consistent with that diagnosis, it's reasonable to say we've watched this. That's empirical evidence. The, the pieces of the puzzle fit. And there are personality types that individuals like this will seek out and manipulate who will enable that who won't challenge them because they don't want to lose their love and who are controlled and conditioned because they threaten them with abandonment. And if they have attachment issues, well, if they have them, they're going to be totally captive. And if they don't have them, they're going to develop them because of all of the ultimatums and the repeated threats of abandonment. Do things my way or I'm going to ice you. You know, it's pretty typical. And I, when I spoke to my dad about it, you love your kids. You don't want to believe it. So it's almost like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of death and dying. You go through predictable stages. One of them is denial. It takes a long time, you know, rage, denial. It takes a long time to reach acceptance when you're hurting that much. And so I, I don't fault him. I think it would be wrong to call him weak and an enabler. And sometimes you can love someone so much is it a flaw in you or is it that you love them so much you're willing to make concessions for them all the time and you don't recognize it as enabling? But have you talked to him about it, Sam? Have you told him that? What you're doing is actually more detrimental to any you know you know relationship you may have. That's I, actually, by I, behaving that way, he is he's basically enabling her to keep treating him that way. So that instead of him putting a stop to it and maybe, maybe, if he sees something like, you know, wait, he's changing. But for now, he's, he recognizes yeah. that behavior because that behavior has always worked, you know? Well, he might recognize that, but that doesn't mean he's going to stop. He can't just turn love off. And he you got to remember, he is 79 years old this year in July. Wow. So it's very hard when you're brokenhearted and broken down and downtrodden because you've been abused in the he's media. Sick. And you love your child and you don't want to die without closure because screw all of the media, screw everything that's going on in the world. This man loves his daughter. This man shouldn't have to die with a broken heart after being stepped on by her repeatedly. It's not goddamn funny. It is very serious. And I think, you know, shame on her if she does not uh, get counseling and make it right. Like, I mean, she might not be able to recognize it. There are some people that can't be empathetic. They don't have remorse and shame. And it may be a little bit of nature, a little bit of nurture. There might be a, you know, an organic basis to it. And then they learn and perfect their uh, tactics that become habits over a lifetime. And it works in their favor so that they can manipulate people for their survival and their security. But when you do it to your own father and you watch him suffer and you watch him almost die, not once, twice, but three times, two heart attacks, a stroke and a pandemic. I'm sorry, but I think that is heinous. I think that is just cruel. And I, 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 I honestly, even with my degree in counseling, because I'm all it's not just objective it's subjective from the inside. I can't look at her and understand how the hell she could allow 
him to feel this way. And I know that she's, she's not allowing it. She's promoting it. She's the one who's causing him to feel that way. It's not that she's allowing it. These are not feelings that appear out of nowhere. No, oh, no, no. And let me, let me, out of Megan's behavior and actions, in my opinion. And let me speak to that. It's not about an obsessive dad who feels abandoned. He didn't know that Sunshine Sachs is a multi-million dollar PR powerhouse and that these articles out there were written and had to be approved to skew an agenda. It's like, oh my God, the media is getting to them. Let me throw dirt on them and disparage them so they won't be credible. You did that to your father, in my opinion, all of the, the pieces of the puzzle fit. So not only did you ignore him, you created the torment, not just in the media, but on social media amongst trolls. And for someone who said that she didn't pay attention to media, she and Harry Shurinsall came out and said, stop that. That's racist abuse of my wife. Well, how would you know if you're not watching the media? They saw everything that was going on. They saw my father suffer and they allowed it. Reminds me of the movie Gladiator. And I'm kind of relating to Maximus. Uh, and in my opinion, she calmed us and the whole father and the vengeance over, you know, the father uh, and his not death, but his torment. And um, sadly, someday death will all die. But um, it's just very sad because it almost feels like as if it were a gladiator sport, like they were sitting up in the Coliseum just watching all of this on social media to their delight. I think that's pretty goddamn sick. No, really? I agree with you. And you know, people are asking if you know anything about Meghan Markle gluing some girl's eyes and while she wasn't uh, soror sorority. No, no. I, no guys. I don't I'm understand that Samantha had a life. Right. Well, you know, let me just tell you, here's the dichotomy to me. I have defended her where I think people are wrong. If I heard filthy names, whether they're racial or about lifestyle or nightlife, I defended my sister because she's the little sister, just like when she showed up at my graduation in a gorgeous blue top, all busty, and all of the men were looking at her. I was like, get your eyes off my sister, you little wolves. You know, I was feeling really protective over her. That is always still there. But as an adult now, I can keep it in its proper perspective. So if she's doing something wrong that hurts someone else in the family or she's lying, I'll be the first one to say it. But if there's something unfair that she's going through, I will also say that too. So I don't, you know, it's not unidimensional. Yeah, uh, no, so you don't know whether it is true that the woman that she should. I don't, I don't I, I'm not defending her, but I will say I don't believe that. I don't believe my sister would knowingly, innocently, maliciously, recklessly glue somebody's eyes shut. And there was no evidence of that that I saw. So, again, I'm one of those people like, let me see some evidence because that seemed. I got to tell you something, Sam. Of all this worldwide mess that your family has been involved in and other people, I am, and even, you know, with the behavior panel, Everybody, nobody touches Doria. This woman somehow unscathingly mm -hmm. goes by. And I mean, the behavior panel, I was I was sure that they were going to talk about it, you know, like because Doria was a whole episode. Wasn't she one or two episodes of the Netflix thing or yeah. how important she was or the fact that she was the only family member and black family mm -hmm. member. There were no other oh. black family members. Why is Gloria getting away with so much? Nobody's mentioning oh, her. And then, let's let's bu bust it out. Like, throw her into the ring, too. Since you're analyzing everybody, bust out those tapes. You know, because when she sat there and said about my dad, she goes, she goes, he sold paparazzi photos. What kind of parent does that? And I'm thinking, wow, dad was her primary parent. That was a stretch for you to open your mouth and spit out that lie just to give yourself a temporary sense of one upmanship, that was just sick. Uh, so I, and that was totally lying. So I wanted to see what the behavior, what the behavior. But nobody touched this about. woman, nobody. I mean, I'm what looking at this, I mean, Netflix, she Netflix. lied. In Netflix, she lied when she said that, you know, Megan grew up with her alone in a black neighborhood and she didn't have the black conversation. I mean, and then we, I mean, how can Megan be raised by a black woman? She said that she raised Megan with a bunch of other strong black women, right? 
and they didn't have the well, conversation no, with no, Megan? No, no, no let, let's fix this right here. What that means is when she spent time at her mother's house, where whether it was when she was little and they were splitting time between the households, is that Doria had friends in the neighborhood who would pop by or, you know, they would go somewhere and they would interact, but that doesn't mean raised by. Uh, so that's a huge stretch, and that was a lie, and that was a skewed agenda. But for her to do that in Netflix, which already we know is was a $100 million PR machine, there's so many holes in that, legal holes in that, uh, that it, it's like a piece of um, large grade cheesecloth at this point. It's like there's so many holes, you know, you could just run water through it. Uh, but, did you ever but, meet the black side of the family, Sam? Of course. Did you guys have a relationship? Like, I mean, did you guys hang out or whatever? Of course. And, of course. and we've shared photographs. And so has my brother, Holidays. And I love Doria's sister and Jeanette when she was alive. And um, even Alvin and Sandy's boyfriend. And, you know, it, yeah, that's life. That's how families are. Uh, so, Do you have any relationship with him right now? No, I haven't spoken to them. I think the whole media thing, one of the things it did, I think it made people afraid to come out and talk. And I think it made people afraid to contact each other, not knowing, you know, if there was an agenda or who maybe is under the thumb of someone else uh, behind a paywall. I was going to say, because they have stayed awfully quiet. And what's even more important, the press is not hounding them, <laughs> which I find incredible. Here's the thing. I mean, they did come out and sell pictures and talk for a while, but then they sort of receded into the shadows and got busy with their own lives. But with regards to your question of why they seem to be leaving Doria alone, if you look at social media trolls, there are Sussex Squad trolls and all of those, you know, cluster of cronies out there that are deifying her, saying, oh, she's the mother queen. Bullshit. Snap out of it. That's not reality. She's not a queen. And you don't know anything about her background. You can try and hang on to your bubble all you want because you don't like that, you know, the, the fairy tale jumped off the tea towels. You don't want to accept that the fairy tale didn't work out. Well, it's not a personal affront to you that it didn't work out, so let go of it. Yeah, uh, what do you think the press is more, you more than Meghan Markle's black side of the family? Because I would think that Meghan Markle's black side of the family would be a more interesting approach given her ethnicity, but yet well, nobody's touching them. Nobody, think, nobody's think, touching think them. It. Think about it. There would be, um, you know, in terms of, of paid PR and certainly negative paid PR, to silence people. They did their little stint and then they went and they were quiet. But with all of the mudslinging about racism going on, if the media did pick on them, one of the first things everybody would say was, oh my God, that's racist. Oh my God, you know, because it's, it's identity politics and right now it's working in the world. And it's causing a lot of problems. It's causing a lot of division that's not real, that's not necessary. And it's like, Groupthink escalation. You know, once people get involved in this like opiate escalation and it becomes heated, even angry, you can't really de escalate it. And so people lose their sense of their own values of what they once cared about. Because, you know, in most in, in LA and most of the places I've lived, we didn't see racism. People, we were going to nightclubs, dancing, everybody was cool, having fun with their friends, and you didn't care about skin color. But now all of a sudden over the last couple of years, because of the jump starting of identity politics and that shit started in the seventies. And I will say shit uh, because it's not what, what happened in the seventies. I'm not invalidating that, but it's now being fueled by globalists who want to create more vision to suit the social agenda of redistribution of wealth, breaking down social unity. So the smartest thing people could, could do would be to say, you know what? We're not really divided. We're not racist. Let's just all get along and stop this shit because it's being fueled by the media with a political agenda. And that seemed to work hand in hand pretty psychotically with the royal wedding stuff, especially as things started to fall, fall off the tea towels. It's like the, there was a political agenda that complemented this and a lot of 
I'll say DNC and radical left money that made it work perfectly. Like these two are royal trophies for identity politics and social division. So something like that is really hard to deescalate because you're going up against a huge political movement that's got billions of dollars behind it and people like Klaus Schwab. And I know, I know my stuff. So it's a lot bigger than just the royal wedding. And it's a lot bigger than just a few trolls. It went globally. And they didn't want to call out Doria. People were reluctant then to spotlight something like that because it would be considered racism. And I think Are you scared of her? Do, do you think that she's a person that people should be wary of or, you know, because... I, I made a joke about it. I did it on my video and I said that she's like a snake, you know, she slithers in the background, you know, she's, but she's always there, you know, and, and it's like, I mean, this woman, I, even the, I was really looking forward to the behavior panel when they did that Netflix analysis. I thought, okay, now we're going to get something on Doria talking, what her motivation is, you know, that we're going to well, discuss. First, first of all, thing. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but, um, it's my understanding that, um, there are a lot of things that have been, she never owned a travel agency. She was never a flight attendant. All of that is just troll fodder. But I think that all of this silence and what you might call slinking around, I don't see it as evil or powerful or intimidating. I see it as cowardice. It's like, you know what? You claim that you were a social worker. You see your daughter's identity suffering because of her father, you know she iced him. So instead of working towards conflict resolution and everybody being on the same page so that people can be whole people and that their wellness, their mental well being, their mental health is, you know, up to par and is healthy, you should be working for that reunion. And instead, you're out there going, ah. You know, I don't know. She, he took paparazzi photos. And what kind of father does that? First of all, Megan's not a child. You don't know anything about the paparazzi photos. And you and everybody else and Harry and Megan have done more to exploit and grift, so to speak, as people call it, and make money off of everybody else, especially the royals. Netflix, Finding Freedom, all their other stuff, the podcast, the you guys exploited everybody for money. Who the hell are you insulting anybody about a stupid paparazzi uh, thing that was a setup? So for her to come out and say that, again, just like what I said about the behavior panel, guys, it's not ethical, it's not professional, and if you were such an expert, you would be working towards unity. You wouldn't be behaving like a snitty little high school girl under the bleachers insulting the other team. You know, it is very childish. It's very unhealthy. It's very unethical. So get with the program. Put, you know, you call yourself a social worker. Put the pedal to the metal because we're not seeing it. I'm going uh, to ask you two, two things. One here is like um, from Chase uh, because I, I do, I am fascinated by this fucking behavior panel thing. Uh, I am sorry about that, but it's true. I just can't get over it. You know, it's like, ah, it's, um, I... I I don't think it's it is very hard when you have people like them who should be impartial and experts okay. snickering and belittling you guys because we have people because of their self-proclaimed expertise and because that's what they start with. You know, a lot of people even now they're saying when you're here in the chat, oh, you know, Samantha's giving their resume. Well, when you go to the behavior channel, panel channel, they set their resume. They keep repeating how much of an experts they are and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's okay with it. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, what your yeah, credentials yeah. do and everything. But it's, it's this wait. is what people don't understand. They, they Other people believe it and they go, oh, wait a minute. But even if the behavior panel who don't usually trash other people like that, you know, speak about you guys like that, it takes it de dehumanizes you guys and it makes you like a very funny punchline. Well, it doesn't dehumanize us. It dehumanizes them because I don't care what you say about your credentials. 
if you are out there slinging mud, making derogatory remarks, contradictory to ethical standards and professionalism or expert conduct, uh, you're only making a fool out of yourself. And so, of course, trolls love that there because these, you know, I'm not going to call them names, but these guys, when they slip and made some mistakes and derogatory remarks unprofessionally, thereby um, contradicting the definition of expert, right? It facilitates their dysfunctional agenda, the social media trolls, because they're like, see, they said it too. Well, okay, are you guys smart enough to look at the fact that they're calling themselves expert while they're making uneducated derogatory remarks? I'm not a stepsister. Um, you can't stereotype about MS or, <clears throat> or about strokes. And would you like someone stereotyping about you if something happened to you? No, but well, of course they didn't do any background. It's like they didn't know. I mean, I don't mean to be to to be prepared about you, but at least do a little bit of background so they know your education. Because in order for them to profile something, you have to have a little bit of a backstory. You well, know what I mean? they they ran this stupid little disclaimer. And sorry, Chase. I mean, you did do that, and you said, "Well, we don't really know, you know, the the dynamics of the family." Okay, then you're opening your mouth because why? You know, and there were a lot of people out there, even Royal Griff said, she said, we can't really understand how to fix this unless we have all the facts. Well, guess what? As the public, you can't fix anything and it's not your business to fix anything. But for people out there to be mudslinging like and saying negative things, knowing nothing about us. And there's already a lot of evidence to the contrary. We're not uh, rednecks. I don't listen to country music. I'm not all those. And stereotypes professionals don't engage in stereotypes but you saying redneck is like me calling you an uh, an, oppressed, an oppressed mama, <laughs> an oppressed, oppressed mama's boy with an inferiority complex i mean i could get a panel on you too guys and probably be a lot more accurate about you guys than you are me but i'm not going to go there because i'm better than that and so uh and it wouldn't be fair i have no reason to hurt you other than to say you were way off base. But for you to know how toxic media and social media are to get out there and to call our family rednecks and to make stereotypes about disability after my dad had a stroke, clearly you're not educated enough. You're not doctors. You don't know that strokes present differently depending on where in the brain you've had the stroke. And just because you had a stroke doesn't mean you can attribute a limp to the stroke. It doesn't mean you can attribute shaking hand to a stroke. My dad was nervous because he hadn't spoken publicly after his stroke, which was only a year ago, not four. That was a heart attack. But people shake when they're nervous. My dad hadn't spoken. And it's really humiliating for an established man to have to learn how to form words again. So really, you guys need to bite your tongues. And I would say um, they probably hurt your credibility a lot because professionals don't behave like that. No, I was actually quite shocking, especially the bald guy. <sighs> and then Scott on the other side. I don't, Mark is the one on the bottom, I think, the British guy. is like, this, this. I was like, why are they speaking? Because I've seen some of their videos and they never this bitchy. Because this is, to me, how they came across as bitchy. You know, it's like, I, I was very surprised. There was nothing. Oh. There was nothing at all. I mean, nothing yeah. at all about being professional about this. I thought mm -hmm. there was like a four middle aged gossipy man uh, trying to belittle a family. You, you while hit that the, their job. You, no, you hit the nail on the head. You're so preaching to the choir. This is the power of media at the behest of paid PR, especially uh, you know aggregate news. These guys regurgitated erroneously some of the crap that's out there in tabloids. Redneck, because my father or my brother joked about the Dukes of Hazard one. So trolls were going, ah, they're rednecks. So that little buzzword might have been floating out there. But for these guys who are supposed to be experts to pay any credence to that and to allow it to slip into their perception of us, the social perception, as was created by a media construct, it just it is the opposite. It's the antithesis. Hey, there's a big word. 
It's the antithesis of professionalism or ethics. Guys, what are you doing? You know, what people also don't understand is that I can imagine because I think Trevor was in shock when Megan divorced his ass like that. Yeah. I think he couldn't get over it because in his mind, everything is okay. okay. So right. mind, even your dad said that, you know, that even Trevor was shocked because he didn't really see it coming. It's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. Cause these guys, here's another stereotype. They said, Oh, because of her MS that explains the drawn hands. Well, yeah, my hands stay curled and sometimes it's hard to lift and do things. Sometimes they're not. I mean, with MS, you sometimes, and it's different from person to person, there are good and bad days. So some days my hands fully open, but uh, I would say most of the time because of progression, they're not, but you know, it's kind of rude and humiliating to say, yeah, look at her drawn hands. Uh, yeah, look at Thomas's shaking hand. It is like you are mocking something tragic and that's physically difficult to go through and shame actually them. mocking the moon bump i wish they would do a behavior oh, panel in the moon bump how it changes i mean that oh, would be very i, I watched that well, <laughs> that's how they did it it was gossipy no shame on them i mean you know talk about lacking empathy remorse or shame I hate to say it but maybe you'll have a stroke one day and i'm not wishing that on anybody but if you do you'll get it and sometimes yeah. it takes that to get it like that did was just Trevor, yeah, crazy. Did Trevor ever reach out to you guys when Meghan Markle dumped him like that? Did he ever try to understand or because I know it took him. All, and now this is for the people here. They're talking about Mr. Markle being obsessed. And he's a 79 year old who's his his daughter who's ill. And Trevor, it took him years to get over. It. He still couldn't get over it from what I understood. Did he ever reach out to you guys and say what's going on or try to recruit you guys to help him? Let me, let me stop you all because for all of the people out there saying nasty things about my sister, is it obsessed for Amanda to think, I don't care what the world says or maybe she needs uh, mental health counseling, but I love her. She's my baby. That's not obsession. That's love. And it's not like a sick date who's on the lawn refusing to let go of a lover throwing beer cans up at the window. It's a father. Who, whose hopes, dreams, every moment, every breath went into building her, loving her. I mean, that's what you do as a parent. So if you guys want to call that obsessed and you can't understand how a father, parents don't just turn off those feelings. I don't know what kind of parents you are, but I mean, I think it, it would take a really shallow parent just to stop the feelings of love. And so it's not for you to judge or call it obsession. It's not obsession, it's love. Maybe After a lot want... of you don't know the difference, but you need to maybe do some research. But let me tell you something how powerful that the behavior panel guys were because after I watched it, I, you know, I was convinced that your father was obsessed. I even did a video and I said, I think Mr. Markle, no, I'm, I'm not joking. I, I actually did say that because I was like, when you hear the people in the behavior panel, you know, and, and, and you respect them, it's like Dr. Phil or what? Not well, I don't know if Dr. Phil, I don't respect them, expect them anymore. But it's like, you know, these guys and, and they're like, yes, and we have like 30 years in behavior and we have this and it's like an obsession. I'm like, wait a minute, if these guys are calling and maybe maybe they're on to something, this is wow. why I actually wow. wanted to talk to you about okay. it. Here, here's another example. A doctor with a PhD might tell you to go cut your kid's genitals off. Are you going to think, oh, God, that doctor's an expert, so I better go cut off little Johnny's pee, -pee right now? Or are you going to get a second opinion? Are you going to look at your child? Are you going to think, no, I don't want my child harmed. Maybe I better wait until my child is 18 and let it be his or her decision. Are you going to use empirical thinking skills and be proactive rather than reactive, flying off the handle and going, oh, my God, it says expert on their thing, so they must be an expert. Oh, don't get me started on Chris Boozy, self-proclaimed expert. Well, he's, he's in trouble with, with he's, he's in trouble with Lester. <laughs> with several people, and Nate Brody, his dad is not reportedly not qualified or backed, uh, and is shoddy and was allegedly behind a paywall to skew an agenda. So when you see the word expert, do not be so narrow-minded as to go, oh my God. He's an expert because it said, 
what is wrong with you people? Are we in the 1600s or are you capable of saying, hmm, let me go look up those credentials. Let me see if the business has failed. Let me see how it was. And you're watching him demonstrate that he's not an expert and that he's unethical by saying, I'm an expert, but I'm calling these people who have been through a lot and are suffering, I'm calling them rednecks. Is that how experts behave in your book? I suggest you get some new books on your bookshelves because you're watching them contradict themselves and you're still out there in chat rooms going, oh, but they have so much credibility. They're experts. Oh, my God. Be careful crossing the street is all I got no, to say. I'm not joking, but it, and then oh, I thought, wow. wait a minute, because I'm a mom and, I, and, and I'll tell you something. It's, and then I started thinking, wait a minute, if Henry did that to me, I would fucking kill him. I, I, I mean, I would just kill him just to, to yell at him and put him back up again, you know, because I can't even think about it. And then I started thinking and then I went back because I actually turned off the behavior panel thing. I, after a while, you know, I didn't even watch the whole thing. Um, and, and I was like, you know, wait a minute, you know, these guys, why, why are they doing this? And I mean, I, I, I gotta be honest, mm -hmm. I, it's like Netflix thing with Megan and Harry. I turned off, I couldn't even watch this six episodes, like the whole thing, you know, it was like, no, some, sometimes you have to take a step back and look at the narrative and ask yourself, does this seem skewed? Do professionals say this and insult people? And at the same time, um, Chase said, well, we, you know, he, he ran a disclaimer and said, we really don't know the family dynamics. And what the hell are you doing calling them rednecks? What are you doing talking about their feelings and interactions? If you don't know, you go do your research before you get, you know, on live streaming and tell the world. Because otherwise, people who are smart enough are going to go, wait a minute, you just said you don't know. So you're ignorant. You're demonstrating your ignorance. You know, and, and people in the audience need to be smart enough to catch these things. It's like if somebody, if somebody, if really bad traffic on the street and you can't see, you just went to the eye doctor and your eyes are all blurry because you got those drops. And um, somebody is saying, I'm an expert. Trust me, it's safe to cross the street. Isn't there going to be a little part of you that's going to go, well, how do I know you're an expert? And I really can't see, so maybe I shouldn't cross the street yet because it could be fatal. In other words, don't be so gullible and don't put so much trust in people who might have an agenda to say this stuff because it's been out there salient. Sunshine sex is vicious. If they don't like me, they're free to try and sue me. Good luck with that, babes. But they run seven or eight publications and several television shows. So when I saw television shows going, oh, that hag, stepsister oh she's jealous she's this uh i thought uh who's paying for this because you don't know anything about me you don't know that i love my sister and also defend her but i'm not gonna let her do this to our family you don't know what's going on all you know is what you're reading in tabloids and so for the behavior panel to react in a reflexive way that seems to be shaped by really bad tabloids because it's reminiscent of a lot of the gossip that was out there in the verbiage that was being slung around. You guys are doing the same thing Twitter trolls do. So are you experts or are you trolls? I would say by demonstration, I don't want to be name calling, but I would say that behavior was not um, researched, educated, or ethical. Let me tell you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dispel something here for people. I had a situation in my life where I kept a dignified silence because a lot of people are talking and trashing you guys because you don't you you have spoken out. Now, I made the horrible mistake of not speaking out and defending myself. And my ex took that as a sign of weakness and he ran with the presses. It's been 8 9 years. And now and I was saying and I was he was the one lying. And now when I finally speak out, it's like people don't want to hear it. They go, oh, just let it go. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm still called a child trafficker. I'm still mm -hmm. called a liar. I'm still called a thief. I'm still called a spy. Right. I'm still called everything. And if I say and try to clarify something with 
documents that he's lying, that he lost a court case. You don't want me to speak out because it's not gossipy and that's not dignified. Well, no, and, and, and it, would, it would burst their bubble. It would burst their bubble. But don't you, doesn't it strike you as odd that all these people, I mean, there were people like people telling you to be quiet and let it go. There were people telling us to let it go. There are still people out there saying my dad's obsessed. Sweetheart, it's not for you to say my dad's obsessed because he loves his daughter and gave her everything. Step off the curb. What's really weird is that the same people telling us we should STFU are total strangers out there talking about this all day long on the phone with their friends. Did you hear they did this and this? And oh my God, those nasty rednecks. And oh my God. You know, so we're not allowed to talk or speak out. When when publications are out there lying, but you guys are allowed to be out there talking about us in a negative way all day long around the world. Laugh about this. Nobody's criticizing Harry and Meghan for not keeping a dignified silence. I mean, the fact that they went on Oprah, oh, they're speaking okay. their truth. They're entitled right, to speak right, their right. truth. Well, you know, how can people be such hypocrites? Even the ones that are here, because I have some sugars here in the talk. No, let me let I mean, me just it's tell you that. for Meghan Markle and Harry to trash and slander, and they right. call that their truth, and that's okay for them not to keep a dignified silence. But if you uh, got, uh, 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 there was no, there was no, there was no, not, there was no dignified silence. When you got somebody behind the green curtain, like the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain who has multi-million dollar PR powerhouses shaping social perception, writing articles that are approved or at direction. That's not dignified silence just because you don't see their mouth move. They're speaking out in a different way using other people, press communications secretaries like Jason Knopf, Sunshine Sachs, Sarah Latham, to get their message out. Oh, and... I know writing books and doing podcasts and doing television shows is dignified silence when your production company controls the whole narrative and the whole everything. Netflix was just a distributor. So don't tell me about dignified silence when you're driving the bus. Hmm. Uh, you know, and so we don't have to be quiet and you wouldn't in your family if somebody was out there lying about you you would be up in their face even you chase know? said that chase said that that you guys you know that if it had been the thing if they had if his family had said the things thing that he said about it would be and you know what's worse Sam? let me just tell you this if you don't defend yourself and oh they're right because you know then if you don't defend yourself and you keep quiet then then mega must be right because they kept quiet and if you defend wow. yourself it's oh how dare they you know they're trashy it's like but, you, but here here's the thing you know this is a weird phenomenon you guys because like people have to pick their battles and within their own families and their own lives you deal with issues that are more pressing some stuff you have to say eh that doesn't have any merit i'm not talking about it and just because you don't talk about some things doesn't mean oh my god it must be true because you guys don't get to be everybody's judge and jury. You guys don't get to say what someone should feel uh, or say or respond to. And people don't have to defend themselves against your backwards perceptions. If you don't understand something because you read an article and it had an agenda, that's not my problem. And if you were in my wheelchair or in my dad's shoes, you were in our position or as Paula had been, you would want to get out there and say, no, this is not true. This is not, I'm not defending myself. I'm setting the record straight. And your inability to properly process reality, evidence, and engage in deductive reasoning is not the problem of the person you're attacking. So you need to get a grip. You've taken way too much liberty on yourselves to be everybody's judge and jury. Look at your own lives and start there. Hey, we could be, uh, we, we could have World War III as a backdrop. Don't you think you better maybe deal with your life because life is short? Seriously, I know people are interested in it, but this is not just about interest. Some of you people out there are like so obsessed in this stuff. You talk about it all day. You can't sleep. You, you can't eat. You're getting angry. Why? Why, why, how, why are you so enmeshed? 
in other people's lives. I mean, I get that you might need an alignment. So you feel like, wow, their life's pretty jacked up. My life's pretty good compared. And that that's an opiate as a coping strategy to socially reference to feel better about your lives. But when you start slinging mud and getting nasty to people that you don't even know and, and attacking them, you've stepped over the line and you're demonstrating your own mental health issues by behaving so irrationally. So, you know, it, it was it's terrible was because I remember I, and people would, I, I, you know, I, I could cry it. And because I was too embarrassed for people to find out what was going on. And then he just, because abusive people, they only escalate until they're stopped. And I thought, you know, surely because I am winning the court cases, he's being sent, sentenced to a one-year prison and he actually fled the country. Yeah, he was sentenced to one year in prison. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know that. He was sentenced and he fled the country, you know. Um, but I kept quiet and I let him have the narrative worldwide and, and people kept saying well if she were if she were innocent she would come out and speak out but the media didn't want to hear it and then when i do speak out people criticize you and it's like well you know keep a dignified silence that's the father of your child and i'm like wait a minute i am the mother of his child he's saying all these lies about me you know and i wasn't saying lies i was saying the truth and i can imagine that it's the same way with well, you guys. I, I mean when you when you talk about dignified silence we all know who your God is or what you believe in, what your religion is. We were given a mouth. We were given ears. We were given a brain. And depending on your culture, um, in the United States, we are raised not only because of media, um, but I'm a woman. Women um, have more developed parts of the brain. If you look at glucose, uh, radio glucose imaging, women have been notoriously the primary agents of communication because of our language skills. Well, there's something to that. I'm a talker. A lot of us talk. We were raised in the United States in the entertainment industry, freedom of speech and expression. So we are used to talking. I'm degreed. I learned in school. Uh, I, always, I was always a talker. And I always believed that the only wrong question is the one not asked. But that doesn't mean you turn it into hatred and attacks. Uh, and, you know, it's just... It's not rational behavior, and the public seem to get overly enmeshed in all of this. So, you know, there's dignified silence, and I know in British culture, they believe, you know, that you should never explain, never complain. Um, I think in some instances that it, uh, has an, an application that is appropriate, but I think in others, it can be deleterious. You know, they're it, and you have to you you have to look at the context and use your instinct. If someone's lying about you, you don't have to have a dignified silence. They have to be dignified enough to apologize, confess, and straighten their shit out. And I'm not going to candy coat this. I mean, I'm so tired of people out in the public really having the emphasis on the wrong syllable and engaging in these behaviors that are like nasty junior high school crap. And some of these women, some of these people are in their 50s and 60s. But I get that it's an opioid. I get that the adrenaline rush um, might feel good that, ha ha, I'm with the right crowd and oh, we're just great. It's groupthink mentality for some. And it gives them a false sense of security in their often powerless lives, especially with everything that's going on in the world now, the insecurity of war, the politics. It's scary for a lot of people. So these little opiates by go hiding under the umbrella of someone else's family and slinging mud is an escape, but it's not real. Did you guys ever know about some Meghan Markle's involvement in Soho House? Did you guys were aware of that, that mm -hmm. she was so deep in involved in with them and Marcos Anderson and all those people? Or was that no. like? No, in fact, you know, a lot of people like there were, there were times like we would um, talk by phone and stuff and, um, even by email, but I knew that she had a lot of stuff going on in her personal life. Well, guess what, folks? It's We weren't estranged because we were horrible. Maybe we were estranged, did you ever think about this, because she had stuff going on in her life she didn't want to talk about, and she was doing I can imagine she wouldn't want to, she wouldn't want to advertise what she was doing. Whatever the case is, I mean, some of the people out there only look at one side of it without 
going, hmm, well, maybe they didn't communicate for a while because she was busy globe trotting, and she was hanging out in places she might not want to tell her father about. Hmm. But did you ever guys talk to Trevor at all? Like, I'm, I'm very curious whether Trevor, you guys ever communicated to Trevor after the divorce? Was he shocked? I mean, because that must have been a shock for him. Um, you would have to ask him about that. I yeah, think no, right. um, to hear that he felt like gum on a shoe and he said that verbatim publicly, I think is pretty succinct. No, because yeah. what I mean is like, did he get desperate enough to contact the relatives to see if you could help him because he didn't understand what was happening? Uh, no, no I, uh, Trevor is not a desperate man that needs to contact people to help him. Um, he's a pretty amazing man, very strong of character. And so that being said, um, we didn't want to bother him. It, he just, you know, we were respecting his space. Must have been embarrassing what she did, huh? I wouldn't call it embarrassing and it's not embarrassing for us. I, in my opinion, it's more embarrassing and a poor reflection of her. No, and no, I, think, I mean, but what I mean is you must have felt bad for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to say, everybody's an adult. You know, we make our choices. Um, yeah, it was wrong. What happened to him? I don't think he could have foreseen it. Do we feel bad for him? No, because he's got an amazing life now and, a wife and a baby, I heard. So, uh, no, it's I don't so think weird. Talking about that. Actually, when you look at it like that, one door closes, another opens, and all of that had to happen for him to have the amazing life he has now. No, but I wanted to talk to you about that because Harry right now just said something to the newspapers about he's suing them because had they not interfered, he would have been happily married to Chelsea. I mean, Whoa. Instead of being like Trevor and just letting it go and instead of being thankful that he didn't end up with Chelsea because he's with this most amazing woman, which is Megan, and has a beautiful family. Why is he so bitter, do you think? Um, I, I think, in my opinion, um, he's struggling with some arrested development. You got to remember his life was always fast. Here's my panel thing. Uh, his life was moving fast at adolescence, which is really critical, especially when you lose your mother and your identity is shaken and everything you thought you knew about your attachment and your identity in the world is turned upside down. So um, that being said, I see him as constantly grasping for straws to fill some of those voids. And he engages in a lot of attribution errors. Like it's not the media's fault what happened with Chelsea. Um, there, it reportedly, there were things in their relationship that wouldn't have worked for her. And you can't really assume that in absence of media that they would be happy now because um, we'd like to believe that he might've been a different person in a different relationship, but you don't know that. So maybe he would have behaved in ways that were offensive to her. You, know, you can't predict the trajectory that their relationship would have taken. For him to blame the media is more of an attribution error, again, lashing out at the media, that he was also driving the bus for and paying and had a lot of control over for a long time. They lost control of the media when people started seeing some dishonesty when their lives were being debunked. And a lot of the media, from what I saw, were going, uh, we're not going to be a party to this anymore. Like, you can only pay for so much control, but we're not putting an amber glaze over this because the world is seeing it and talking about it. So, you know, I think he lost grip of his ability to control a lot of the media that he also, on the other side of his mouth, claims to hate. Um, he was also reportedly friends with Jack Dorsey and had a lot of influence over social media. So don't give me your little sob story about you blame the media for everything that went wrong in your life. You, although you suffered from arrested development, in my opinion, you made your choices. You made your choices to drink a lot and party and have fun and be a playboy and, you know, prance around in a Nazi swastika, even though you didn't like the social responses to that. You made your choices. You're not a child. And you can't blame the media. You can't blame your parents anymore. It's been a long time. You have to be a man and be accountable and look at 
what you did to create those consequences. Yeah, but, but I think he's complaining about that, Sam, because he's not happy with what he's got. Because as you said, Trevor is not complaining because his life is a million times better now. He's married to the daughter of a billionaire. He has a beautiful daughter. He's happy. Whereas Harry seems to be bitter with what his law in life is right now. Instead of, of, being course, of course, of course. When you burn all your bridges and you treated people horribly and you made choices, you, it wasn't haphazard that you did that to your family or lied about your dad and said you never got hugs or bicycle rides and gave uh, descriptions of the layout of royal residences or talked about fantasies of your dad being chased in a plane and that the only reason he didn't die is because you told your friend not to do it. Or of your, you know, I mean, like the the stuff he was spewing in despair, he's, he can't be that mindless. So when you knowingly and recklessly hurt people, there are consequences for that. What it's did you think of him with the coronation? Insult. What did I think of the coronation? No, oh. what did you think of Harry at the coronation? Um, and what did you think of the coronation? Well, the coronation was a beautiful ceremony. I think I'm not going to get into the rhetoric and the history because so many journalists covered it, even though I studied it. I, um, I was surprised to see him there. Appropriately, he was not wearing a military uniform after what I and so many others feel like was betrayal of Great Britain and the royal family. Uh, and, you know, so many attacks on the sovereign. I think had some clear social repercussions. I mean, it, there was a moment where he was looking over at William and George and Kate, and he looked like he was like a lost puppy, like he had been, he was at the back door and they wouldn't let him in, like he was iced out. Well, duh, if you treat people like that, you are persona non grata. And if you can't have the frontal lobe, to understand applications uh, when you act like that, then you need a counselor. And you really haven't evolved beyond a 12 year old mentality. Because I mean, I think a lot of 12 year olds even understand consequences to actions. So I, I think a lot was traumatic that happened to him before his frontal lobe was fully developed. But there have been so many years in between and by his report, and his mental health apps, and he said he and his brother had access to counseling. The onus was on him to seek counseling and to make sure that he was thriving and you know becoming fully functional as a man. And and to just let loose on your family like that as a loose cannon, lying, doing damage again and again and again because you seemingly don't get your way. Oh my God, grow up. You know, and I so I thought I thought the coronation was appropriately handled by the royal family in that he was definitely put in his place and in a diplomatic way. Um, even, even let me, let me get this, even Camilla's ex husband was sitting in a second row behind his kids, and he was third row, the son of the sovereign was there. You know, that's very telling. Well, but but even given that, I mean, he knew also um, it's reported that he wanted to show up for his father, that that is, you know, part of your duty as a royal. <clears throat> I was kind of feeling that his intention was to make a statement and a really clumsy and inappropriate if that was his M.O., um, because it backfired on him. And I think, he, I think he needed to feel that and see it to grow up. No, if you don't get the consequences of your actions because you're across the pond and your father, like my father, has a soft heart and he's always wanting to extend the olive branch. Yeah, that's another thing. Why, why, can, why do people not say that Charles is obsessed about Harry? <laughs> exactly. It's not, it's not obsessed. It's being loving, and but I think a lot of parents don't realize that when you have a child who is reportedly a narcissist or who is mirroring one and is not demonstrating empathy for a variety of reasons, and Harry wasn't, you know, 
fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Fool me three times and hasta la vista, baby. I, mean, I do believe that Charles is enabling Harry. I really do believe in, 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 in Charles is in a position of power and, and he lets him get away with so much stuff, you know? But because like my father, I think he knows that um, Harry needs his love. And, I, and but we can't, we're not talking about, Harry and Meghan are different people. So I don't want to refer to them at, as if they're the same case, they're different. Their personality profiles are different. So I think Charles has sensitivities about his son clearly, um, knowing a lot of what he's been through and is willing to still be there. But I think he's arrived at the point where he wants to see uh, some accountability, some love reciprocated, some, uh, and a change. And maybe that can happen at some point. Do you think Harry's an idiot? Not, not, I don't mean like, he, oh, he's such an idiot. I mean, like mentally, do you think all his marbles, do you think the elevator reaches the penthouse in that building? You know? I, I think that's wrong to say on the grounds that he, by his own report, he has been ingesting hallucinogenics, the chocolate mushrooms. And there have been a lot of reports and, and clear evidence of substance abuse, whether it's alcohol or other narcotics and opioids. So he's apparently filling in some voids that may link back to his mother. But, you know, he can't keep using that as the reason he's making all of these reckless choices. You know, you don't crap on your whole family and attack them because you're sad over the loss of your mother. Sorry, a lot more people lose a parent and lose people they love and don't treat others like that. But it's, it's a nice um, red herring and a smoke screen or being lazy and not wanting to do the work and being accountable in my opinion. And it's also painful though, to come face to face with that and to take ownership of it and um, apologize to and correct those wrongs um, that you've thrown at others. So uh, maybe he'll grow up and do that. And I think Charles is aware of how difficult that was with the distance with the circumstances of the relationship and a codependency there in that marriage, in my opinion. So he was trapped in between a rock and a hard place and maybe in a better environment, he will be able to get some mental health help and heal. Uh, just yeah, I'm actually, gotta tell you, I'm actually very surprised also because the behavior panel, they, I think they did something about the, um, the book you know, and, and I think they did a, they've done a few interviews about or, or an analysis of Harry's interviews. And they're always positive. I mean, they never raised, given, and, you know, and I don't know why don't you even do a little bit of a research or a little bit of background because mm -hmm. you cannot state this is what's happening if you don't know a little bit of what's happening. Even when they did the Amanda Knox thing, you know, they knew a little bit of the background, what had happened. So when they saw this girl, because if you don't have a context about something, you can't, whatever you see in front of you, you don't know because it, mm -hmm. you don't have the context for it. So uh, they, they seem to choose not to have context about Harry because they portray him as this, Afghanistan loving guy, you know, like this guy who's amazing. Not like it. I really do think that the palace has covered up a lot of Harry's skankiness and he's finding it hard that nowadays there, he's no longer protected in that matter, in that way, you know, I, I don't know. But it's, it's just something that I see the behavior panel. It's like, I find that they use their credentials to pitch a narrative that they want to create out there. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like, for example, they did the same thing with Madeleine McCann. They did the same thing with Trump. I mean, they, they, they did the same thing with Harry, how they portray Harry as this as this a veteran, you know, and you can see that. And now, you know, with Netflix, they didn't touch the black side of the family. They don't ask mm -hmm. the questions that way. So I'm, I'm very surprised, I got to tell you. Well, I, I don't think it would be um, erroneous to suggest, you know, depending on who their clickbait sponsors are, that there could be some narrative, that there could be some influence. I'm not suggesting that because a couple of them 
qualified some things and tried to be more fair and were more accurate uh, on a couple of things. But I think they need to revisit the whole thing and look what was really unethical and makes them look bad and maybe uh, run a retraction. But that's up to them. You know, it's just, uh, I think if you leave that lingering out there, that's your business card. And I don't think it looks that good. Yeah, I mean, I, I was surprised that they said, uh, I think that, it, I don't know if it was the bald guy who said that. This woman seems to have some form of education because she's articulate. No, you're, you're like so... If he had been black and he had said that about you, he would be called racist? Yeah, you're so funny because I want to point something out. This is not an insult to you. We are visual creatures as human beings. Before our language skills are developed and we... Um, have symbolism in place and we understand how to draw inferences about our environment and whether or not we are safe. I mean, I know there are many children who are born, born blind and they compensate, but in the bell curve, we are visual creatures. So um, that being said, you know, it, we describe each other. We socially reference, we make markers about our environment, about which way home is when, You know, we get out of the car or when we're kids and we get off the school bus. Uh, and animals do it too. We are visual for survival. So when you say that bald guy, some people will go, oh, God, that's horrible. She's like, she's bald shaming that guy. No, it's not. You know, and if you, if you describe somebody, sorry, I love my grandmother. She was always very heavy. Um, I haven't always been twiggy in my life. I've been fat sometimes. And I catch myself describing someone in public that fat guy that fat woman that bald guy that you know and yes skin color comes into it because whether it's if someone if there's an emergency in public and someone says can you describe that guy that just ran by well yeah he was five six and this and that and this and that skin color is going to come into play if you remember it all of medium complected medium build you know five foot eight wearing a blue denim shirt You remember the color of a shirt, I guarantee damn well you're going to remember skin color. But we, the point is, is that we are visual creatures. So it's not wrong to say someone's bald if that's what you made a mental note of. It doesn't make you a bad judgmental person. Um, and, and I used to get touchy because I don't want disability to define me. So I thought, wow, if she's saying, oh, that's Samantha in a wheelchair. But I had to come to terms with it is visually a marker. It stands out. Like you remember things that stand out about someone because otherwise we're all pretty generic. You know, you have to describe hair length. Um, if someone can't walk and they're in a wheelchair, yeah, that's a person in a wheelchair. You wouldn't call them handicapped because people are not handicapped. They live with disabilities. Um, just like you, you wouldn't appropriately you wouldn't say that bald man like some people might say you would say that man who happens to be bald and you wouldn't say that black man or woman or that asian man or woman you would say that woman who appeared to be asian or if you know she is in other words it's people person-centered language you want to put the person as focal and then their attributes are secondary their characteristics So, but you made me laugh when you said that because I realized how easy and innocent it is to do that. And someone could have run left, far left with what you just said and gone, oh, that Paula's horrible. She was shaming bald men. No, she, you know, spit out the first character description she could think of. So, but, oh, sorry. Oh, you're talking about Mark, but he is bald because you have the other, the other three have hair, you know, it's like when I said the British guy, I mean, it's because right. he's British, you know. And, and there's nothing wrong with you noticing that. But I think more to the point, he's not a bald man. He's a man who happens to be bald. Like, you know, this is the thing I, I think about social labels that are so weird. Like people will say, oh, that disabled woman or that disabled man or that black woman or that Asian woman or that bald. Oh, they call me a wet pack. They call me oh, this wet pack, you know, who doesn't know anything. She's Hispanic. She's Latina. She doesn't know anything. It's so funny. You know? yeah, but, but <laughs> it's, it's weird that as people, we need social labels rather than looking at the fact that we're all people, but we have all this other stuff going on that are like accessories that we wear a wheelchair 
No, I'm not a handicapped woman. I adapt and I find ways to, you know, redefine my life and do things that, you know, I love and that define me, albeit differently. Um, a man who loses his hair will adapt and maybe get plugs or wear a toupee, but he's not a bald man. He's a man dealing with baldness. No, I know, I know, I know, but it's just I didn't know how to, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to say it like. <laughs> well, I'm um, sorry. No, again, that, that wasn't an insult to you. It was actually a compliment because I'm pointing out how easy it is for us as visual creatures to yeah. do that as a reflex. It's normal, in other words, folks. It's normal. Yeah, but it's, it's just nowadays you have to be politically correct. You know, you don't even know if if, if I had a friend and she's like, you can't call me African America. I wasn't born in Africa. Well, if I, should I call you black? Oh, you can't call me black because that's racist. And I said, what the fuck? You're, you have black skin. Well, Why should I call you now? You know, it's like, it's, this, is a, this is a verbal landmine right now. Remember that whole thing with that Marlene Headley and the woman in England who was brutally attacked and called a racist because she asked, where are you from? Well, I learned in multicultural counseling, you know, uh, you don't, you don't want to stereotype. You don't want to assume there are some countries where if you show them the bottom of your foot, you may as well raise the middle finger because that's an insult. In some cultures, if you look them directly in the eye, yeah, uh, yeah. you're stealing their soul. You're not allowed to do that. So when you meet someone, um, you know, they can seem generic. You know, if someone if someone's out in front of my house and they are wearing wooden shoes uh, and they look like they're from Holland, I'm going to say, where are you from? And that's not wrong because their outward symbolism, their clothes are not indigenous or symbolic of the region. But when people are wearing just generic clothes in a counseling setting or even when you first meet people, there's nothing wrong with saying, how do you prefer to be addressed? How, what would you like me to call you? Because I want to be respectful. I don't want to make mistakes and I certainly don't want to offend you. So in order for me to get to know you, tell me how you like to be addressed. And that clears it all. And some people, oddly, then this is not your baggage. Some people will get offended that you ask. Mm, that's a conversation and a relationship that's going to be really hard to develop because they're way too touchy and they're running a script in their head that's not rational. Uh, in most cases, most people, I think, would welcome you asking them. Yeah. Well, let's thank Samantha for joining us. She's given us two hours already, of almost two hours and a half of her time. Samantha, I, I wanted to bring you, people have asked me, why do you have it if you're not grilling her? Well, this is not an interview. This is a conversation with Samantha because I wanted you guys to see her from the point of view as a human being. And we're reacting to the behavior panel because I, I found, I got to tell you, I was actually swayed by them a lot. And I'm like, and then I started thinking, you know, because it's it's like when, when you have somebody you respect and it, they're speaking about something and you go, oh, wait a minute. And then I thought, I'm, I'm falling on sugar behavior as well. You know, I, I, I did. I, I don't mind admitting it. I mean, I, I, I don't mind saying when I'm wrong and when I'm right. But you did, you, wait, did, you, did you hear what you said? That there were some people out there going, how come you're not grilling, Samantha? What gives you people the right to grill anybody? Like, if you want to learn about somebody, learn about them, be open, be positive as they unfold, watch their actions. But don't, you know, people are not there for you to put on a stretching rack and go, let's grill her. No, you know, let's, hey, let's get all you on and grill you. Let's look at your family life. Let's look at everyone you dated. Let's look at your jobs. You know, how would you like it? So, you know, I think in all fairness, it's always great to meet people. I welcome questions. But grilling has a negative connotation. It suggests like an agenda that's damaging and that's not so nice. No. So look at your own motives. Mm. I really wish you luck. I sent you the link about Shalon Lester. I don't know if my, my viewers uh, know. She's also sent legal letters to, to, to Meghan Markle because apparently also Shalon Lester is running a cabal, according to Bozy. She's oh. running a cabal. So Shalon Lester, you know, Meghan Markle oh, and her sister oh. are because Shalom Lester used to be the editor of Star Magazine and Megan used to come and work for them and she was a source. 
I and know. she also sold stories to them. So she pissed the wrong person there. But well, we're, you know, it's politics too. We're in a, a day and age where through media and social media, if someone's not sucking up to your narrative and they reveal you or challenge you, you are running a cabal. And, you know, uh, Chris Boozy is saying that any that somebody's running a cabal. Look at what the hell he's doing on the internet, having bots attack people. Some of his posts have been vile, have been like something out of the 1600s, uneducated, nasty, attacking. Who's got the agenda here? Who's running the cabal? Scoot over, Chris Booz. You're not an expert, in my opinion. There's a lot of data to support that. So take off. And, and, and anybody who believes is self-proclaimed expert, why don't you look at the credentials? Uh, how is he an expert? His last four businesses, his online dating service, what makes him an expert? And are his actions, his attacks of others online, his attacks of the royal family, including the children, no expert who is a mature man attacks children. So, you know, you don't just look at their credentials, look at their actions. Are they consistent with that title? All I got to say. I hope, you know, I hope your dad gets some sort of closure with your sister because I really do believe that what's causing him most harm is his refusal to accept his new relationship or the lack of with Meghan Markle. You know, that's eating him up. And actually one thing that Chase said, that you know, he started to describe the, the 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 medical side effects of stress and all kinds of things. You know, and he said it gives you strokes, it, it raises your your adrenaline. I mean, he went in description and, and everything. He was very very good at that point. I like that because well, it's like yeah, you're, you're right. Some parents, um, because they're so loving and soft, have a hard time reaching, going through the stages like stages of death and dying, have a hard time reaching acceptance. And so that being said, you know, you have to, I think a lot of parents know, you can, like I said, you can put their tools in their toolbox and hope they make the right decisions and that they reciprocate and that they're complete with a beating heart, empathy, remorse, and shame. But it's not a guarantee. And when you realize that you are at an impasse, it's hard, but you have to let go in that you don't stop loving them, but you stop expecting and you stop beating yourself up over it because yeah, that, yeah, that's what I think is happening to him because that refusal for him to accept what's his new reality with his daughter is what's really eating you up because I'm sure you're talking yourself a lot. What can I do? It's and it's something that eats you up, you know. Uh, and I think it's from my point of view because I'm a parent and the Hendrik did that to me. I probably would be doing the same thing, you know, but. At some point, he has to, for his own sake. Well, I mean, and consider the context. Most of us are in the middle of our lives. I mean, we're thinking, oh, there's so much time. We have so much time to, you know, have life be the way we want it to be. Well, for someone who's 79, the, his life is more finite and it, it the end is more, seemingly more imminent. He could live another 20 years, but he's smart enough to know the life is short and you don't have a lot of time. And that is scary when you love somebody and you feel like you might not get to say goodbye. You know, Samantha, I really, you know that I'm rooting for you in that fucking lawsuit. I hope you kick ass. I hope it gets to where it needs to go. Um, I mean, I, I am wishing you the best. Some people are saying that Scott Krause from, uh, from what's it called, Final House or Behavior Panel wants you to reach out to him. No, he can reach out to Samantha. <laughs> You know, there are ways for him to reach out. You don't reach out to him. He has to reach out to you. I mean, I have, I have no problem. I'm not egotistical that way. I mean, I kind of, you know, I, I respect that. I, I wasn't dogging on them by saying it was unprofessional. I was just speaking the truth. What they did was not professional, but that doesn't mean I don't like them. Trying not to make judgment calls. And of course I would reach out to them. Okay, uh, go for it. And I think, I don't know if it's true though. This is somebody who's posted okay. that comment quite a few times. I don't know because I don't know if it's true. I haven't seen it. And it's I'm pretty sure that, yeah, I am pretty sure that if he wanted to reach out to you, he could, you know, I'm sure that they have ways of going about it. You know, there, God knows that we have, there are many of us YouTubers who would give you the message, you know? So if the Scott wants to reach out to you, he can do that. You'd be more than happy to talk to them and dispel any 
misinformation that they put out there. Well, I'm in Florida. I'm like near the coast. So you could put a message in the bottle, drop it in the ocean, you know, it'll float here eventually. Just yeah. to close it, your your eyebrow, there's nothing wrong with your eyebrows. Not some sort of profiling not, that needs to happen, happen because it's, you know, or that you call Meghan Markle the little sister and that, you know, that she put emphasis in the world little, you know. Because that. because when you're when you're older and when your your baby sister is born in your house, and there are adults that'll say this who whose adult children have died. You always see them as your little baby. That's not an insult. It's that you're cherishing a time in life that was precious, that was untainted, that was innocent. And and when you have a lot of really fond memories, it's not an insult. Um, there are people that it's a term of endearment, I think. In most yeah, people. I was shocked that he said that, that that word triggered him or uh, something like that he said, but that word really. Uh, 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 okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, some, I'm going to hear stereotyping. The word little triggered him. Does he have phallic issues? I mean, you know, we can drop. Uh, we can drop. <laughs> so can you, babe. Oh wow, that stuck out like a sword. It, it, I was just shocked, you know, the little the minutia that they picked. I was instead of actually something, you know, but it's my minutia that they were picking. I don't know if they were doing it for clicks or you know to 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 sell the interview more instead of actually focusing on because I'm no expert. So I can't, you know, I can only give my opinion. And I say in my, in my videos, I give my opinion, you know, sometimes I change my mind. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I get angry because, you know, I exploit, I re I should actually, I should actually know, because I have the habit of when I see something, it bothers me. I do a video immediately or I go live. So there you have it in a nutshell. You don't have to maintain a dignified silence oh. on that happy note. <laughs> thank you so much samantha thank you so very much sweetie thanks for your kind time thanks for coming here and this is always your channel you can come anytime and you know okay. no don't don't get offended i mean i because i learn i i know quite a bit of spanish especially all the bad words i would say adios mija Gracias, but, amor. if i call you mija like some people go who's she calling me little sweetie or little but that's normal here that's right Thank you. Actually, I think it as a compliment that you took, you learned Spanish to say it to me. Así que gracias, Samantha. Muchas gracias. Buenos, buenos días and hasta mañana. Hasta mañana, Samantha. I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, sweetie.